I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for, for coming tonight. And we have a pretty full agenda, so we're going to get right into it. Um, and as uh, Scott had mentioned, just a reminder that the meeting is being recorded. It will appear on YouTube uh, several days after, after the meeting is over. Uh, first uh, item on the agenda is the uh, accepting the minutes of the August 10th, 2020 Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, can I get a motion to accept the meeting minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I second that. Okay, is there any comments or questions? Of August 20, or sorry, August 10th, 2020. Yep. And if you have any questions, just uh, either um, unmute yourself and speak or type into the uh, text box um, that you, you, are, uh, you wanna say something. Um, but if there's no comments, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. Um, next to the, uh, the reports. First up is the uh, police uh, chief. Good evening. For the month of August, the police department officers documented 1,109 incidents in the police department call reporting system. I was able to identify 667 of those entries as incidents wherein someone was specifically requesting the services of the police department. During the month, the officers issued 161 traffic citations. They investigated 28 traffic crashes and they arrested 18 individuals. Uh, additionally, for the month of August, the department members conducted three motor carrier details at the way station, resulting in 757 trucks being weighed, uh, three of which were found to be overweight. Eight federal motor carrier inspections were also performed uh, during those details. Uh, year to date totals, the officers have weighed 3,959 trucks. Uh, that's about uh, half of where we were this time last year due to the uh, health crisis. Yeah. Uh, we opened those way station details back up again and we've been pretty successful with being able to keep everybody safe doing that. Uh, so far, the officers have identified 32 trucks as being overweight. They've conducted 63 inspections while on the details and additional six inspections while on their daily uh, activities. They have found um, 17 of those trucks to need to be placed out of service, uh, one additionally while they were on their regular detail duties. And they've placed six drivers out of service during the details and one driver out of service uh, during their regular duties. Uh, so far year to date, the officers have issued 829 traffic citations. Uh, they've issued 185 written warnings. They've arrested 103 individuals and they've answered 8,791 calls for service. Uh, year to date, the officers have investigated 185 uh, traffic crashes, again, which is considerably down due to the lack of traffic that we had uh, at the beginning of the health crisis. And lastly, uh, year to date, the officers have administered uh, Narcan on four different occasions. Okay. Thank you. Um, next, the uh, treasurer. Yes, through the month of August and the general fund, we have collected a little bit over 71% of our budgeted revenues and have spent just under 62% of our budgeted expenditures. Thank you. And public works? Great, uh, for the month of August, uh, the daily average flow to the downtown treatment plant was approximately 1.29 million gallons uh, per day. And there were no new sewer connections to either the Eagle View treatment plant or DARA. Um, as far as rainfall for the month, we did have another active month, uh, especially with the tropical system that moved up earlier. Uh, we received 11.07 inches of rain for the month of August, uh, the normal being 3.9. So again, uh, we're significantly above average. And I think at this point, we're about 14.5 inches for the year above average. Um, the department responded to 148 PA1 calls, as well as completed daily station checks and their meter checks and sewer uh, meter checks as well as right-of-way mowing. The Public Works Department was active in the Williamsburg Boulevard area re re repairing some damaged asphalt in the area and I also just wanted to mention too we are still working on the Norwood Road culvert so that road is still closed at this time. Um, there is a detour posted for traffic to flow. Um, we're still trying to get a better idea of just how long that, that project is going to take. Um, but that's it for now. Thank you. Uh, fire marshal report. Uh, yes, for the for the month, the building department continues to issue uh, building permits and inspect those projects that are under construction. 
And I also had uh, 37 fire responses for the month. Okay, thank you. And the, uh, the fire, Lionville Fire Company. Yes. Fire Company responded to 77 alarms for the month of August. Of those 77, 41 were in Euclid, 15 in Upper Euclid, 9 in West Pikeland, and 12 in other townships. Thank you. Yep. And finally, the uh, Euclid Ambulance. We have a representative from the ambulance. Okay, it doesn't look like it. All right, um, then uh, can I get a motion to uh, accept the reports? Um, I move that we accept the reports as presented. Amy, are you on mute? Sorry, <laughs> I'll second that. Okay. All right, uh, so we motion to accept the reports. Uh, any comments or questions? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes. Um, moving to the uh, the heart of Euclid update from Tony Gorkin, who's a member of the Environmental Advisory Council. Thanks for letting me be on the agenda. Uh, I'm assuming you can hear me. I unmuted. Yes. Um, the Heart of Yukon project is a project that started last year to um, introduce native plants to the Yukon Township grounds, um, create a place for a nature walk within the Heart of Yukon, and to provide examples and education for the public on environmentally sustainable and more ecologically sound gardening and management practices. Uh, we had a very, very successful uh, summer. Uh, visitors to the grounds of the Yukon Township building were treated to a successful milkweed garden uh, with blossoming milkweed plants. We had monarch butterfly caterpillars and uh, lots of other butterflies visiting. We had several comments on the increase in the butterflies and uh, so forth in, in the area. And uh, uh, we, uh, we need to thank several volunteers who kept the plants watered during the hot, uh, dry parts of the summer. Um, now that it, autumn's on us, we're planning to renew the garden in the spring and we will be collecting uh, seeds from the plants that are there now. Um, we're planning to try and repeat the workshop that we gave last fall on how the best way to sow milkweed um, seeds for plants because we got a lot of interest this year. People saw the garden and they wanted to know how to um, grow their own, which is exactly why it's an example to the community of what they can do in their own gardens. Uh, we're a little challenged by the COVID restrictions and looking at some kind of media-based way to repeat that workshop. I uh, haven't quite decided, but anybody who's interested should watch the EAC page uh, and see and, uh, for announcements on how we're going to do that. Uh, I know we've had a lot of inquiries about it. Uh, in the meantime, there's a handout uh, among several that have been placed on the uh, EAC page of the uh, township's website. There's one on there uh, uh, from last year's workshop about how to plant the milkweed seeds. There's also a handout about the milkweed garden talking about what kind of plants uh, to plant for supporting pollinators and increasing your biodiversity. Uh, again, to educate the public on how they can um, do better in terms of ecologically sound gardening. Um, the other uh, major area that we had, um, we did a riparian border along the stream below the lowest pond. Um, a riparian border is um, putting in plants that will support, uh, that will handle the, the dampness uh, the wetness of the ground and help manage flooding, uh, reduce the erosion to the stream, and otherwise increase the biodiversity and, and generally manage that area. So we planted a garden and it grew very well. Um, again, we plan to expand that more along the stream in the coming year. 
uh, and to repeat some of the things that we did last uh, fall and winter, again, as examples to the public for things they can do in their own similar environments. Uh, another project that we have been working on is to try and set up a um, nature, a trail through the grounds of nature learning stations. Uh, there's an amazing amount to see once you start wandering around down there and the opportunity for um, children, school children, families and whatever to uh, do nature observations and uh, explore. Um, we created a, we have created a, um, a map that we'd like to distribute and then also we have a handbook that gives several pages of information about each station uh, that tells fa nature facts about the area and suggests environment learnings. Uh, we also have uh, started to place some markings that we have made out of tree slices to identify those uh, areas. It's Again, it's a little challenging with COVID to uh, invite the public and welcome them to use these facilities. I think that's probably gonna have to be held off until next spring or whatever, but we are prepared and maybe there's some, uh, we hope for maybe to discuss in the EAC some opportunities to promote remote learning opportunities for families who are dealing with the remote education. So that's the project. We've been exploring plans for next year. If you'd like to get involved, we do have some volunteers. We're working very carefully to observe COVID restrictions, dist safe distancing masks and all of that. Um, and it's again, kind of hard to uh, bring people in to become involved, but we hope that we've stimulated your interest. And if you are interested, contact the EAC using the contact EAC link on the website. And again, I'd like to repeat, there are numerous um, plant lists and other information that we've posted to the EAC page. We've had a lot of questions about that, that the whole process has aroused, like, well, I'd like to do a garden like that. What do I plant and so forth. And so we're putting information and education materials out there for the public. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, I've been back there. It looks, looks very nice and uh, some interesting work you're doing. So uh, thank you very much. Um, let's, do you, Mamie or Kim, do you have any other comments? I just want to say that I've personally enjoyed it and I recommend um, anyone who hasn't visited uh, the township property recently come by and check it out. There's just a lot of new stuff going on and great ways that residents can copy what Tony is um, doing there and, and the EAC so that we can um, increase our biodiversity, support pollinators. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll move on to the uh, MS4 pollution, pollutant reduction plan presented by Dan Daly. Good evening, everybody. Um, I am Dan Daly with uh, Edward B. Walsh and Associates. We are the uh, township engineer for, uh, for the township. And um, I think S Scott Greenlee is going to put up a map here for me. Um, perfect. Um, so I'm here tonight just to uh, give you a brief update and overview of our MS4 program and uh, uh, what we're doing with our um, uh, recently submitted uh, pollution reduction or soon to be submitted pollution reduction plan. So it was a real quick background here. Um, the township has a uh, MS4 permit, which is a municipal separate storm sewer system, M and 4S's um, program here, uh, permit from DEP for us to manage our stormwater. Um, all the um, local municipalities uh, within the region ha have this, if you're meeting certain criteria. And uh, as part of this program, it's been going on since 2003, I believe. And um, uh, as part of this program here, some newer regulations that have come out has, uh, have, is requiring us to um, implement some stormwater management improvements to help improve water quality. So um, the map that you see on the screen there is, um, is a map of Euclid Township. Uh, the orange border is our uh, the township, township border. And uh, we have color-coded 
Um, the three watersheds within uh, Euclid Township uh, colored kind of that purplish blue uh, color, which is um, areas where we have to do a pollution reduction plan. So I uh, actually was back in front of the board in 2017 uh, with this uh, similar presentation. Um, we had made an application to DEP for a pollution, pollution reduction plan. Uh, they um, uh, have kind of modified some regulations and rules and associated with it and did a review of our plan and provided some additional guidance. Uh, we are now in the process to, uh, to re-update that pollution reduction plan. And uh, in short, what this is gonna uh, uh, have us do here is for those three watersheds, which is the uh, 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 an unnamed tributary to the east branch of the Brandywine Creek in the far left-hand side of that plan, you have the center area, which is a Shimoda Creek watershed, and then you have the West Valley Creek uh, watershed, which is also known as Lionville Run, and that's the uh, that's the creek that runs down by the uh, Marshwood Shopping Center. Um, so we are required in those watersheds to, uh, to implement improvements um, uh, over a five-year period that will help reduce the um, uh, pollutants within this within the stream. So the, so DEP is uh, requiring the township to impl implement um, improvements in the field that help help solve the problem. So what the EAC has been doing is is gonna is gonna obviously benefit the uh, township here too to to achieve the goal. The ultimate goal of this program is to is to get our watersheds to be to meeting water quality standards. Right now, uh, the watersheds um, in most of Chester County are impaired for one pollutant or another. Um, a significant part of it is uh, sedimentation, um, uh, siltation. And uh, so the goal is to, uh, with this program, is to improve the water quality um, uh, within, within the watershed. So as part of this pollution reduction plan, we are um, uh, proposing that over a five year period to implement various stormwater management uh, 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 projects that help improve water quality. And uh, some of them are gonna be stream bank stabilization projects some of them are gonna be um, uh, uh, retrofits of existing basins. So either basins that are owned by the township or potentially owned by a homeowners association, the township is going to look over the next five year period to, to potentially retrofit some facilities to improve those facilities functioning so that they can reduce the amount of pollutants that are leaving them. A lot of uh, Euclid Township was developed in the, in the 70s and 80s and B 90s uh, before all, all the current stormwater management regulation um, uh, um, control factors were put into place. And uh, there are some improvements that can be done to various uh, stormwater management facilities that can help uh, have them operate, operate in a better, better um, uh, be, uh, operate more efficiently. So um, uh, we are basically uh, going to, uh, to work on trying to, uh, to improve water quality. Um, as part of this pollution reduction plan, we are um, uh, part of this presentation is to up update the public on what's going on, um, but it's also a regulatory requirement that, um, that the public have to, has an opportunity to review this plan um, and to make co public comment on it. So uh, the township has done a, uh, an advertisement in the Daily Local, uh, advertising this until October 14th, 2020. Um, the uh, pollution reduction plan can be viewed on the township's website. Um, and I also believe we have a hard copy located in the lobby. Uh, I believe the township is, uh, is still officially closed, but the, uh, people can enter the lobby area and view that pollution reduction plan or view it on the township website. Um, and uh, and submit written comments um, to the uh, to to the township on any uh, concerns or issues or or support of the uh, of the pollution reduction plan that we have uh, we have prepared at this point. Um, the plan does show various stormwater management facilities and and stream bank stabilizations. It it doesn't have details of what we're going to do to those facilities. Um, this is uh, the plan is a kind of. Um, an uh, overview of the of the of some options for us to go ahead and do and over the next five year period we're going to look at each one of those and some of those facilities may not be feasible to do retrofits um, um, or stream back stabilization projects on because of uh, um, some other constraint or environmental constraint or, or some other issue associated with it so this is just kind of an overview of that we, hey we, we if we we have options to go ahead and look at to, to make these improvements as as we need to um, so 
Uh, so right now, um, that's kind of where we're at with it. Uh, after the October 14th um, uh, date uh, for the end of the public comment period, we will make um, make submission to DEP. DEP will review and approve this, and they have a lot of municipalities to look at. So um, we're hoping hoping maybe uh, by the end of this year, um, the beginning of next year, we can have our blessing, and then we have uh, we'll spend the next uh, year or two after that working on some planning documents and, and looking at our options. And then uh, uh, I would anticipate in maybe year three, four, or five to uh, start implementing some uh, some of these uh, improvement programs to. Uh, to, to, uh, to help improve the water quality. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, I don't know if uh, the board and or the public, uh, you guys wanna handle that for any comments that they uh, people may have at this time? And I'll just add, I know you said it, um, that this plan is on our website, but if you go to euclid.com and go to the featured links, there's a stormwater tab that'll take you right to this plan online. Great. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, from the public or from the other supervisors? Sorry, it looks okay. like there is something in the chat. Okay. Um, I, I can just read it. Sure. Um, Dan, is part, of the, is part of the goal of the pollution reduction plan to reduce the inputs, root cause of the pollution? Do we know what the major inputs to the pollution is? I hear you speak of the watershed bank stabilization and basins, but I'm curious about the root causes to the watershed pollution. Thank you. Sure, I can answer that. Um, so uh, our streams are um, impaired for um, siltation. Um, so I'm looking back through my version of this here right now, um, see if I can actually list it as. So our three watersheds are, um, are, are, are listed for siltation are the issues that we have within it. And the causes of those impairments our water flow variability. So, um, in short, what that what that means is is that we have these flash flood events, and during those flash flood events um, uh, and various heavy storm events, with the urbanization that has occurred um, within the watershed and upslope areas, um, um, uh, pretty much all of Chester County, um, you end up having um, a large amount of water that comes in that creates erosion on people's private people's properties. Uh, within the stream banks, and uh, ultimately here, that's that's what our pollution is. So we're not having um, other pollutants uh, or serious pollutant issues um, from other um, uh, Superfund sites or anything else within uh, within the township. So um, uh, the the goal here of DEP is to um, promote. Um, groundwater recharge. The more water we can promote to go into the grounds and recharge the aquifers minimizes the overflow of stormwater um, into the streams, into the stream banks, causing causing uh, erosion to to occur. So the root cause basically is um, is, uh, is 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 trying to promote as much groundwater recharge, and that's what um, the the DEP would prefer us as far as projects go to do. Ba new basins, basin retrofit projects, and then um, uh, deal with the stream bank stabilization projects because the stream bank stabilization is kind of putting the band-aid on the water flow variability issues. They'd rather promote that water to go into the ground and therefore we minimize how much erosion you're going to occur within the stream banks. So ultimately here, that's, that's the that's the goal here, the root cause that we're going to try to try to work on for, for this uh, for, for this watershed, for the all of our watershed area areas at this time. Okay, Cass, um, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I see the other comments here too. I don't know if Katie, you wanna just run through them? Yeah, so um, just to follow up on that one, Kathy's, Kathy Sotak, um, Sotak said, got it, thank you, Dan, for the ad additional information. Um, the next question, um, Michael Taylor, how will the HOAs be notified of the process or recommended changes? So um, we will uh, we will not if the if a basin is not owned by the township, um, then we will are going to have to um, get permission for whether it's a private individual owner basin or if it's a um, 
um, uh, an association um, is, is we need that buy-in. So if there's a homeowners association that isn't interested in working with the township to do a basin retrofit project, then we move on and find another basin within the township. Uh, luckily, we have lots of basins um, to, uh, to, to choose from here. So, so during this process, as we work through the design, we will reach out to the individual HOAs or individual property owners and say, hey, we'd like to do this project. Are you willing to work with us and, uh, and kind of uh, um, uh, figure out a way to, to, to make, this, make this work for both parties? And that, that's the process that will happen. So right now, we show various stormwater management basins to be retrofitted. We have not spoken to those HOAs at this, at this point. That's an item to come up here in, in the future. Um, the next question from Alexa Manning, what type of water quality monitoring is ongoing in these watersheds? Um, so at this point here, um, uh, the, all of the impairments um, that have come through here are DEP has gone out and they assess streams. Um, on a on, on regular basis, and, and to be honest with you, I don't think they have a limited staff and a lot of a uh, lot of lot of watersheds to look at. So they've gone out and done sampling within watersheds to determine the impairments. Um, so uh, that is the only current monitoring that has gone on uh, to establish whether these watersheds are considered impaired or not impaired. And um, ultimately, here. Um, there, the township is not undergoing water quality monitoring at this stage of the, at this stage of the game. And uh, <clears throat> ultimately here, our, our goal here is I'm sure later stages within this project here, within the MS4 program, uh, I have a feeling that's gonna be something that's gonna be required, but it's not at this point. Um, so uh, once these projects are complete, though, if we do a basin retrofit in community A, B, or C, um, we are going to have to uh, uh, monitor that project here to make sure it stays, uh, it's operated properly and maintained properly in perpetuity. So that would be something we'll have to work with the HOA when we do a basin retrofit project that we have to figure out exactly how that's going to be monitored and how, how to make sure that facility is going to be um, owned and maintained, maintained properly here coming, coming, moving forward in the future. So, but at this point here, their um, DEP has done some water quality monitoring, but that's, that's the extent of it. Okay, um, Michael Taylor says, thank you. That was a good explanation. And then we have Tony Gorkin. Um, the heart of Euclid stream garden, et cetera, is an example in a small way of using riparian buffers to reduce siltation. And I believe that is all the comments or questions that are in that chat box. Thank you everyone. And thank you, Dan, for, for this. Do you have anything else to add? So I just want to just make sure that um, people can go ahead and submit comments to the, uh, to the, to the, to the township here up till October 14th. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and we'll, we are required as part of that process here to respond to those comments and make sure our plan addresses them as needed. Um, but yeah, submit them into the township here staff um, uh, sometime before, uh, before the 14th, if you'd like it to be considered for the plan. And again, we'll be, uh, this is an ongoing process. This isn't once October 14th comes, it's a done deal. Everything's complete. So we'll have, uh, we'll have plenty of time to uh, work through this over the next five year period. Great. Thank you very much. And, sure. and I, I just really quick, um, we, we do have some stormwater resources for residents on the website, don't we, Scott? We do. And in each e-newsletter, there's also a feature on stormwater and how you can reduce your impact. Yeah, so that we can, like, as Dan said, if res we're, since we're mostly residential, if residents can do their part to help keep stormwater, you know, going into the ground instead of down down your driveway or into the street and down the storm drain. Is that when your you're heading, Sorry. Oops. When you're heading over to the website to look at the plan, there's uh, there's many links to the left that will um, help with problems and getting results and solutions for stormwater. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, we'll move on to the, uh, the next item. Thank you, Dan. Um, at the uh, appointment to the Gilkin Township Municipal Authority. Well, I think this is probably the most excited I've ever been about an appointment to the Municipal Authority. Um, we have Doug Hanley, uh, former Township Manager, we're ex very excited to have him interested in participating in the Municipal Authority. He brings 
many, many years of experience to the, the authorities. And I think he, his name speaks for itself. So. <laughs> So I think, uh, yes, I think his qualifications are, are probably better than anything we could possibly find um, <laughs> anywhere in this township. So, um, uh, Mamie or Kim, you want to make a motion to appoint Doug Hanley to the uh, Euclid Township Municipal Authority? Sure. I'll make a motion to appoint Doug Hanley to the uh, Euclid Township Municipal Authority. Uh, Kim's probably on mute, but I'll, I'll, I'll second. Um, is there any comments or questions? Um, if not, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> did we did we lose Kim? Sorry, I got dropped a few times, okay. and now I now I'm using my iPhone. Okay, we just support. We just voted to. Point, Doug, did you have any comments or objections? I think great choice. Thank you, Doug. Yes, there you go. Uh, okay, thanks. I'll move on to the uh, Eagle Disposal Renewal. So the Eagle Disposal contract, um, when we signed that, um, we signed it for three years with the option of two additional years. Um, this would be, this renewal for 2021 would be the last year we could renew with Eagle. Um, this time next year, we would have to be going out for bid. Um, I, we're asking the board to renew the Eagle contract. Um, we have not had many issues with Eagle. Um, stating that from the past trash companies we've used, um, there is not really many complaints. Um, there's one here and there, um, but they've been a great company to work for, or for work with, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah. That's, that's all I got. All right, thank you. Yep. Um, I'll make a motion to uh, renew the Eagle Disposal contract for 2021. I second the motion. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments? I just want to, can I make a comment? Just a shout out to um, sanitation workers. They're essential workers and they've been doing an excellent job. Uh, keeping the trash out of our way while we deal with the corona coronavirus. Yes, thank you. All right, if there's no other comments, um, all in favor, the motion to approve the renewal contract for 2021 for Eagle Disposal. Aye. 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 All right, motion passes. Um, moving on to the uh, request for an extension for the preliminary land development plan for the Gray Farm on by, uh, by Worthington Partners. It's two. Yes, I received an email from Allison Zaro, who's representing the applicant, um, requesting this extension. As many are aware, uh, the plans were first submitted uh, to you uh, back in May. Um, after they were submitted, the plan was revised after talking with township staff after we had a chance to take a look at the plans. Those revised plans were then presented to the Planning Commission uh, at their July Planning Commission meeting. Those plans did not have a chance to get reviewed by township consultants. So after that July Planning Commission meeting, they were going back to revise the plans. Uh, they were resubmitted October, I'm sorry, uh, August 14th and sent out for reviews. Uh, the reason they're requesting the extension is because they're planning to attend the October 7th Planning Commission meeting, uh, which is obviously after the September 30th extension that was first granted. So uh, I also just want to make a note that we did receive public comment from Barry Berger today uh, with a few questions and concerns about that. Uh, the reason for the extension I pretty much just explained. Uh, Worthington Properties is a part of MVR Homes, uh, which is Ryan Homes. Um, Tom Kessler has been their point of contact so far. Uh, I would suggest anybody that has any questions or comments about Gray Farm attend the October 7th uh, Planning Commission meeting. So tonight we're just that explanation. You're welcome. Um, I would recommend that you grant the extension 
until October 31st so that you know, we can get the plan reviewed and comments addressed. Okay, and today we're only talking about an extension, not any of the details of the... Okay, um, can I get a motion to uh, grant the extension until October 31st for the preliminary land development plan? Yeah, I'll make a motion to grant the extension for Gray Brothers Farm until October 31st, 2020. I second that. Okay, any questions or comments from the public? Or from I do have, uh, this is Barry Berger. I do have one request, the only one that I'd follow up on from my, my comments, uh, and that is uh, whether or not uh, it would be possible for the township as this project moves forward to uh, uh, create some kind of a link on the township homepage so that some of the underlying documents, uh, environmental reports, traffic reports, et cetera, are, are more easily located. Because with the township offices closed, if a township resident wants to be able to evaluate the facts uh, without being able to gain access to these documents, it would be very difficult. So would that be a possibility down the road? Uh, we were just talking about that. Um, mm -hmm. Harry, if you want to say. Yeah, we are looking into uh, putting all of the plan submissions on our website so that you would be able to take a look at the plan or the plan that was submitted. Um, we still need to go through to see if we can put all of the reports and those sort of documents on there, but you are certainly welcome to email me for uh, any documents that aren't online. Okay, thanks very much. I appreciate that response. You're welcome. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, if not, I'll give a motion to. Uh, yeah, you made a motion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, request is granted. Moving to the conditional use decision for Max Out LLC at 247 Welsh Pool Road. Mark, are you taking this or am I? I can handle this, yes. So this was, um, there was a conditional use proceeding uh, at our um, last, at the township's last meeting um, related to a um, uh, health and exercise facility. Uh, it was approved at that time um, uh, following the, the conditional use hearing with conditions. Um, we did prepare a written report and one of the caveats during the approval is that there may be some additional conditions. Um, I don't know that there's anything of significance additionally, but if, if the board would like, I could certainly just read over what the conditions are in the written approval. Why don't you read what you think the public might be interested in, those who were not here last month? Sure, so maybe why don't I just start out by explaining just what the application is. The app, th this is an application for Exton Max Out LLC, and they were requesting a conditional use approval to occupy a basically a 5,000 square foot um, area of a larger multi-tenant building to allow for strength and conditioning fitness center at the property which is located at 247 uh, Welsh Pool Road. Um, they sought approval pursuant to certain requirements of the Township Code to require conditional use approval. Um, and basically, the, the main limitations that um, we have have to do with hours of operation. Hours of operation of the facility will be limited to 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week. Uh, the area of operation uh, is limited to approximately the 5,000 square foot of this one suite that they apply for. Um, there's some comments and conditions that were um, made by the, in the planning commission uh, as part of the recommendation of approval that are um, as part of the, con uh, the conditions. Um, and and that's basically it. I mean, the main the main thing had to do with um, hours of operation. Um, and Can I add in there for the public that they are a business that operates only by appointment as well as um, training of teams. So 
the public isn't coming in and out between 5 a.m. and 11 p.m. It's only by appointment. And, and they did, during their testimony, they did note that their peak hours are really prior to the normal work day and after the normal work day. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, it's generally uh, in the mornings until about 1 p.m. Do we need to, uh, Mark, do we need to vote on this or is this already approved? Or uh, you already approved it, but you could, yeah, why don't you, you can vote on the written decision on this showing the written decision. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the written decision for the uh, conditional use decision? I motion that we approve the written um, statement for the conditions for um, max out. Oh. Sorry, I'll second that. Okay. Any uh, questions or comments? If not, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. Um, moving to permission to advertise to revisions to chapter two. 260-204 and 260-209.2 for setbacks uh, for tr transmission pipelines, et cetera. Would you like me to handle, take this one as well? That would be great, Mark. Okay, sure. So this is a proposal um, related to setbacks and also the, the implementation of a consultation zone with regard to developments near pipelines. Um, presently, the township has a setback uh, requirement uh, for pipelines that have been in place for some time. Um, that is a, a 50 foot setback um, that has been in place, as I said, for some time. Uh, a lot of that was directed towards the traditional petroleum pipelines. Um, since that time, um, there has been a lot of um, different types of pipelines that have either been in, installed in the township or have been converted in the township. And in fact, if you look at uh, the pipeline map that the county has, Euclid is, is the, there's a confluence of a number of different pipelines that pass through and traverse the township. Um, the, the Chester County has, um, and they have a pretty robust pipeline website um, on their planning that the planning commission has um, and they've um, worked with a number of consultants and other groups, um, and they've made some recommendations regarding setbacks. They put together some model ordinances that they believe are appropriate, or at least have recognized model ordinances that have been put together specifically for Chester County, as well as some other ordinances. And what's being proposed in this, and consistent with what um, the county and some other organizations have recommended is a 300 foot setback uh, for uh, new development and new uses or new residential structures and new commercial and industrial uses uh, within 300 feet of a pipeline setback, uh, as well as uh, what's being called a consultation zone, which uh, requires a developer really just to reach out and communicate uh, with the pipeline companies uh, within a thousand feet of the center line of the pipeline. Okay. Uh, tonight we're just asking for, you're, it's just being asked for permission to advertise. Yeah, this is not, there's no decision being made tonight. This is just putting it out for advertisement so that, um, you know, the, as required by the MPC and, and the, you know, other requirements so that notice can get out uh, and then it'll be dealt with in the future at a future meeting. I believe we're aiming for October 13th, which is our Tuesday night meeting. Okay. All right, great. Um, get, a, get a motion to, to uh, grant permission to advertise to the revisions for chapter 260-204 and 260-509.2. Make I'll make a motion to grant permission to advertise revisions to chapter 260-204 and 260-509.2 regarding setbacks of new development and transmission pipelines and the establishment of a consultation zone. Okay. I second that motion. Okay. Uh, is there any comments or questions? 
There is there is one in the comment box. Um, Michael Taylor, does this apply for all pipelines or just NGL pipelines? This is going to apply to both natural gas and petroleum pipelines. Uh, petroleum products the, is, is sort of a broad umbrella term that includes what's been commonly referred to as the hazardous liquids pipelines as well. So it'll cover natural gas pipelines, hazardous liquid pipelines, and even your traditional petroleum pipelines. All right, uh, if, is there any other comments? <clears throat> Not, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, permission granted. Um, so we'll move on to the permission to advertise for the comprehensive plan hearing. Right, so um, one of the things we have been talking about for the comprehensive plan, which is finally getting to the point where we're ready to have a hearing, um, was the idea of potentially having a separate meeting for that plan so that we could encourage you know residents to attend um, what we're asking for the board to um, give us permission to advertise this evening is to hold a special meeting on uh, November 11th at 7 p.m. Uh, to have a presentation on the comprehensive plan. A motion? I'll, I'll make a motion to grant permission to advertise for a comprehensive plan hearing on November 11th at 7 p.m. I second the motion. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, if not, uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. All right, motion passes. Uh, permission to advertise for bids for the 2020 Eagle View treatment plant upgrades. Great. So, we, we have a few projects in the pipeline for the Eagle View treatment plant, but the, the first is really gonna be revolving around our variable frequency drives, um, as well as our programmable logic control uh, board. Uh, without getting too into the scientific <laughs> weeds here, um, what we're asking the board for permission this evening is to put a bid that we've been working with Gannett Plumbing, um, our sewer engineer, uh, to put together um, to, to get bids for the work to be completed. So. Mm -hmm. Um, we would come back to the board once those bids have been received to award the bids similar to other projects. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion to um, grant permission to advertise for bids for the 2020 Eagle View treatment plant upgrades. I second the motion. Right, any questions, comments? Um, Kim, Kim noted that uh, Dr. Doan noted that the public is invited to read the conference of plan and provide feedback, which is posted on the website. So, thank you. Yeah. Yes, it is posted on the website for public view. Um, all right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. Um, and the Hankin Group's uh, conditional use plan submission for uh, Eagle View Town Center 2. Uh, yes, we received the plan submission today from uh, Allison Zaro on behalf of the applicant, uh, Hankin Group. Uh, they're proposing a town center on the property um, off Constitution Drive, which is comprised of 364 apartments, uh, which would be within several buildings on that property, uh, a clubhouse, an existing office building and a proposed 40,000 square foot office building. Uh, they do need a couple conditional use approvals, um, but this plan is just, the this submission tonight is just acknowledgement that the township received it. Okay. Okay. To get a motion to accept the uh, plan submission. Do we need to accept it? Do we need to? Do we make it? Okay. Right. All right. Well, then, with that, we'll move on to uh, the, the resolutions, which the first is the uh, resolution 2020 18, which is the 2021 police and uniform, non uniform, uh, excuse me, uh, minimum municipal application. Yes. This is a resolution we do every year that establishes the minimum amount that we have to contribute to each of the pension funds one for the police, one for the non uniform. So for 2021, our minimum, minimal, minimum municipal obligation for the police pension plan is 
$476,228 and the munis minimum municipal obligation for the non-uniform pension plan is $204,000. Do you have any questions or comments? Maybe, or can we get a motion to approve the resolution? Uh, I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 2020-18, the 2021 police and non-uniform minimum municipal obligation. I second the motion. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> all, right. uh, all in favor? Aye. All right. Resolution is, is adopted. Uh, moving to the 2020-19, the adoption of the Township Emergency Operations Plan. Right, so the resolution before the board this evening is an administrative um, procedure that the Township is required to complete every two years uh, for our Emergency Operations Plan. Um, pretty much what this resolution is stating is we reviewed the ordinance and are adopting it for the next two-year period. All right, uh, can we um, get a motion to approve? Is there I'll anything... Oh, oh, go ahead. Scott, is there anything um, on that resolution that you want to share with the public, maybe? And any important key points or Mike Holmes? It's actually, it's a fairly short, short resolution. Um, it just, it points to areas of the Pennsylvania Code that require the municipalities to prepare, maintain, and keep current and emergency operations planned for the prevention and minimization of injury uh, for, you know, various disasters that could affect people in township. Um, I mean, other than that, pretty pretty much it's just an administrative um, procedure for adoption of the of the, the current plan that we're that we're using. Mike, I don't know if, if there's anything else that you want to add, but I um, just want to make sure that I'm. No, you're correct. I mean, it's it, this is required, like you said, every two years, just so we're eligible for funding and uh, you know for state and FEMA funding in the event of you know disasters. So. They look the plan over, approve it, and we just have to adopt it by resolution. Thank you. I make a motion we move resolution, we approve resolution 2020-19, the adoption of the Township Emergency Operations Plan. I'll second that motion. Any uh, comments or questions? If not, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, Resolution 2020-19 is approved, is adopted. Uh, move to resolution 2020-20, the Peck Road Culvert Grant Authorization. Um, just a little history. Uh, we have a culvert on Peck Road that is notorious for flooding during almost any, what you would consider a high rain event. Um, what the township is trying to do with this resolution is a, uh, apply for a multimodal transportation fund grant that would help us in redesigning that culvert to hopefully, you know, re reduce the flooding that happens in that area. Uh, just this year alone, we've had several issues with the high rain events. Um, we have an approximate cost for the project at $600,000. We would be requesting $420,000 as part of this grant. Um, but this res resolution is pretty much just authorizing uh, Katie Churchill and myself to sign on behalf of the township. Okay. I make a motion that we approve resolution 2020-20, the Peck Road Covert Grant Authorization, giving Katie and Scott authorization to sign on behalf of the township. I second that. Okay. Is there any questions or comments? If not, uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. All right. Resolution is passed. And the uh, final resolution for tonight is the 2020-21, the master caster agreement with PennDOT. So this resolution allows PennDOT to raise manholes on roadways within the township in order to do maintenance. Um, the, this agreement will take uh, be effective November 1st, or I'm sorry, October 1st, 2020 and it will remain in effect until September 30th, 2029. Okay. I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 2020-21, um, the Master Caster Agreement with PennDOT, which has a really good name, by the way, <laughs> Master Caster. <laughs> I second the motion. All right, any, any comments or questions? <clears throat> if not, all in favor? 
Aye. All right. Resolution passes. Um, next, we'll, I'm going to provide our update on the activities for the Sunoco ME2 slash ME2X program in uh, construction project in, in Euclid. Uh, first, talk about the, uh, which is HDD 310, which is their designation for the site, um, which is at Herman O. West Drive going towards Upper Euclid. Uh, Sunoco is reporting that they are 6% complete for pilot hole drilling for their 20 inch pipe uh, starting from the Upper Euclid Township side. Uh, casing work is underway in Euclid Township, uh, which many people are maybe aware of. Actually, casing work is, I'm sorry, casing work is complete um, in Euclid Township at Herman and West Drive. Uh, the pipe pullback is currently scheduled for the end of January. Uh, the 16 inch pipe has already been installed in, installed in that location. At uh, HDD 320, which is the Herman, Herman O West Drive uh, going towards Wharton Boulevard, um, the 20 inch pipe and the 16 inch pipe work is complete. Uh, their HDD 331, which is at the Dairy Queen uh, in the e Eagle View area going towards North Ford Road. Um, the 16 inch pipe has previously been installed. Uh, the 20 inch pipe is on in, the, in the final ring process and is 13, about 13% complete uh, and pullback is scheduled for early November. Uh, for HDD 350, which is the North Woodford Road going towards Devon Drive, uh, the 20 inch pipe HDD work is complete um, as well as the 16 inch pipe work. But restoration work will uh, is not scheduled to occur until after the 331, the Dairy Queen site and the Devon Drive sites are complete. Uh, for HDD 360, which is the Devon Drive going uh, in Euclid going towards Schoen Road, which is in West, West Whiteland. Um, the, for the 16 inch pipe, um, the currently 30% complete they consider for the final reaming process. Uh, there is uh, obviously, as many people know, there is a, a water flow at the borehole in West Whiteland, which is um, they are they are managing on their side uh, according to what DMP, DEP is requiring at the time. Um, no additional casing work is anticipated to occur at Devon Drive for the 16 inch pipe at this point. Uh, the pullback is anticipated in mid October based on the current condition con conditions. Um, no work has started for the 20 inch pipe at that site um, and casing work will be required for the 20 inch site when, when, that, when that occurs, which is not currently scheduled. So that is the update. Is there any questions or comments? Mr. Chairman, uh, one other note, I think a, a lot of people are aware that um, a few weeks back there was an inadvertent return and a depression at the Marsh Creek um, in the area of Marsh Creek. On Friday, uh, Pennsylvania DEP did issue an order to Sunoco directing that they uh, move that pipeline about a, about a mile further away from Marsh Creek. And at this point, operations in, at that drill site, which I believe is HDD 290, um, are stopped. Um, and but the I think the plan is that it's going to be moved up the ways about a mile. I have somebody in the chat box. Um, on September 10th, Tara sent a warning letter to Sunoco to abate the noise or they will be fined. Did they stop or were they fined? If fined, how much? If they continue and refuse to stop the noise, can they be arrested? What would happen if a private citizen refused to stop violating our noise ordinance over and over again? Would a private citizen be arrested? Just before we before we answer that, is um, can you provide your your full name? Just because we usually have it as a record. Um, so it cut off. I think this. I think it came up as Margaret Quinn, but when I try oh. to click on it, it just says M A R. I I think okay. it's Margaret Thank Quinn. Yep. It is Margaret Quinn. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Scott, do you want? Do you have all the information on the? Well, I'll, uh, um, sorry, I was I couldn't unmute fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, Dan's still in the in the room. I we did not issue a fine for the casing work because I do believe that they had 
completed it prior to or shortly thereafter issuance of the letter. Um, Mark, I don't know if you want to expand on you know some of the legal uh, implications here with the request, but no, no fine was or citation was issued by the township, just the order. Yeah, the 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 ordinance um, calls for um, the issuance of a essentially an order notice um, prior to the issuance of a fine. Um, if if after the issuance of that notice, the activity continues, a citation with a fine can be issued. Um, there's other avenues that can be taken as well, um, you know, that the ordinance allow. Uh, but my understanding is that the the noise stopped. Um, either uh, was already over or stopped shortly after the, the letter was issued. I don't know. I mean, and as, as, as in regards to your other parts of your questions about a private citizen, obviously we have noise, noise reports uh, often throughout the township. Usually an officer will respond and if the noise is still occurring, they will go warning. Um, but, it, you know, all, all of these things would depend on the circumstances, uh, but um, we're not giving, if, if the question is essentially are we treating Sunoco differently and we treat private citizens, uh, obviously there are some specifics that are different because they're a construction site um, and have certain exceptions in an ordinance as, as opposed to, but um, no, we're not being, we're not ignoring certain activities that we think are above and beyond what the, the ordinance allows. I don't, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, how much would the fine be, she asked? I'll have to double check. I believe, uh, I'm not looking at it, I believe it could be up to a thousand dollars. Per day, correct? Per day per violation, yes. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I have nothing else in the chat box. Okay. Uh, if not, I'll move on to the announcements. So for the, the on September 16th, the Envi Environmental Advisory Council will meet at 6.30 p.m. On October 7th, the Planning Commission will meet at 7.30 p.m. On October 8th, the Historical Commission will meet at 7.30 p.m. And on October 13th, uh, which is a Tuesday, uh, the Board of Supervisors will meet at 7.30 p.m. I, and I think all these are, are on Zoom, even though the uh, Historical Commission says Cadwallader House that is being done over Zoom. So um, is, with that, I'll open it up to um, any comments or questions on, on any council-related subject. I just wanted to say that all the meetings on Zoom are open to the public. You do not have to be a member to sit in on one or two or all of the meetings. And Bill, do we have any openings on any of the um, uh, committees that we want to announce to the public? I don't think we do right now for the one, no. Okay. And if there's any additional questions or comments, just either speak up or type in the text box. Otherwise, um, I don't know we can adjourn the meeting. Okay. All right, well, I think we can get a motion to adjourn. Do you want to just mention that we have the conditional use hearing for Audubon after the meeting? Yes, I think we should take maybe a five minute break um, and then do the, Aud the Audubon conditional use hearing. Scott, do you want, if people, um, Scott Greenlee, if you, if people want to stay, do you want them to log off and log back in or is it easier for you and them if they just stay in and take a five minute break? If they would stay on, I think that would just be easiest. Uh, just stay muted for now. Thank you. I think we get a motion to adjourn. Uh, I motion we have a night. Yeah, sorry. Oh, there's one right here. There's another question that just popped up. Did you address uh, the North Ship Road? I'm not sure what that refers to. Could you elaborate? 
person yeah, asking questions. <laughs> Can I turn on your mic, Scott? Yeah, Brian D, if you if you'd like to unmute yourself and just explain uh, what that comment means, I think that would probably just be easiest. Did we interest in worship for building complex on Sherry Boulevard? I I think he's asking about the conditional use. Right. I think you're talking about the Vanguard property, and that is what we just announced will be following this meeting. So. If that's what you're interested in, please stay on and we'll we'll get to that hearing in about five minutes. Okay. I'll make a motion to adjourn. All right, I'll second. Um, all in favor? Aye. All right, we meet at uh, 8.42, we'll start up. Would you like me to get started, Mr. Chairman, or? Yes, if Tara, if you're ready as well. then I I'm ready. Go. All right, well, let's get started. Call the meeting to order or the conditional use here in order, I guess. Port reporter here? Yes. So, this is the um, conditional use hearing for the Audubon Management Corp, who is the applicant, uh, related to a property at 1130 North Pottstown Pike, which is uh, also known as the Vanguard property. Uh, this is located in the PIC, Planned Industrial Commercial District. Uh, as part of this application, uh, the applicant is proposing to construct three warehouse buildings with a total of 1,928,880 square feet and 1,144 parking spaces along with a 30-acre park with trails and other amenities. They are requesting conditional use approval, which is required for, one, facilities for outdoor recreation, not including shooting or archery ranges, motor vehicle racing, or amusement parks. Two, structures over 2% uh, over, well, uh, stories of 35 feet in height, uh, up to 65 feet in height. Three, any non-residential structure over 40,000 square feet or having a total combined parking space of over 200. The applicant is also seeking an extension of the construction period for good cause. The site was previously approved for approximately 2 million square foot of office space for Vanguard. Initially, um, the, the board has a number of exhibits. Um, and before I go through that, is, is um, counsel for the applicant present? Yes, Bernadette Kearney from Hamburg Rubin, present for the applicant. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go through, have you received a copy of the, the board's exhibits? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to go through uh, them, which is also, uh, at the same time, it'll identify the dates of uh, newspaper notification, uh, neighbor notification, and other comment letters. Exhibit B1 is application letter with Exhibit A dated June 30, 2020. Exhibit B1A is application letter dated August 10, 2020. Exhibit B2 is the public notice that was sent to the Daily Local. And Exhibit B3 is proof of publication in the Daily Local, which occurred on August 30, 2020 and, and September 7, 2020. Exhibit B4 uh, is abutting property owners who were notified. Exhibit B5 is the E.B. Walsh review letter dated July 23rd, 2020. 
Exhibit B6 is McMahon Associate, McMahon Associates Review Letter dated July 31, 2020. Uh, Exhibit B7 is Hydroterra Professionals Review Letter dated July 30, 2020. Exhibit B8 is a Stube Consulting Review Letter dated July 14, 2020. Exhibit B9 is Euclid Police Department Memorandum dated July 21, 2020. Exhibit B10 is Euclid Fire Marshal Memorandum dated August 3, 2020. Exhibit B11 is um, a memorandum uh, from Laura Bensky, uh, EAC, or an email from Laura Bensky of the Environmental uh, Advisory Council dated September 2nd, 2020. Exhibit B12 is Historic Commission Letter dated August 17th, 2020. Exhibit B13 is a Draft Planning Commission meeting minutes from September 2nd, 2020. And Exhibit B14 is Planning Commission meeting minutes of August 5th, 2020. Um, Mark, can I also add Exhibit B15, which is the um, Fiscal Impact Analysis Review Letter uh, from Ray Ott and Associates dated August 18th, 2020. I received it after the fact, and I believe the applicant received the copy as well. Uh, Tara, I did not receive a copy of that. Are you able to email that? I will do that right now. Okay. I will not ask you about B15 yet, uh, but is the applicant, does the applicant have any objections to board exhibits B1 and 1A through B14? No. So those will be made part of the record. I will circle back once you've had an opportunity to review exhibit B15 to, to ask if you have any objection to that. Thank you. So the next uh, order of business is going to be to um, find out um, and, and request um, anyone who desires to have party status. Um, and before I ask about that, and we do already have a, a couple of um, requests for party status. I want to explain what party status is, uh, explain uh, what it allows you to do, and also what, what you can do even if you're not a party. Um, so some people, uh, frankly, um, may decide they don't want to request party status because they're able to do what they want to do just as commenters. But party uh, status is available to people who might be impacted by the proposed use. Uh, it allows a person to fully participate in the hearing. Um, it allows you to cross-examine witnesses, to present your own case, and to testify on the record. However, you do not need to be a party to provide public comment. There will be a public comment period uh, available for anyone in the public, party or non-parties, uh, to make comment. Um, if you are not a party, you're not able to appeal the decision um, to the Court of Common Pleas if that is something uh, that you're unsatisfied with. Um, however, I will also note that just because you're a party in this proceeding doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to appeal to the Court of Common Pleas. The standards are a little bit more rigorous in the Court of Common Pleas than they are before the Board of Supervisors. So even if you become a party here, uh, you may still have some hurdles to go through to become a party in court. And the fee to become a party is $20. Um, we do have two applications already that I'll deal with first. Um, the first is, uh, and I believe both of these, uh, both of these entities are represented by uh, attorney uh, Stephen Buck. Um, the first is Pepper PA Associates. Uh, Mr. Buck, are you present? Yes, I'm here. Uh, so as far as Pepper PA um, associates go. Can you just 
uh, tell us what they are and where they are located? Yes, Pepper PA Associates uh, owns the parcel right across the street uh, from the subject piece. Uh, they uh, lease that property to J.W. Pepper and Sons, Inc., uh, a music publishing distributor. And um, did you receive or did your, your client receive notice of this hearing? Yes. Miss okay. um, Kearney, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Now, uh, Mr. Buck and I spoke uh, today in reference to the request for party status, and I did see on Exhibit B4 that the Pepper PA Associates owns property 33-4-30, so I have no objection to them being a party. Okay. Then, uh, so Pepper PA Associates LP will be granted party status for this hearing. Uh, the second um, request you submitted, uh, Attorney Buck, was for DF. T Inc. Um, can you please um, tell us who they are and where they are located? Uh, DFT Inc. is a, a valve manufacturer. They're located at 140 Sheree Boulevard uh, on the same side of the street as this, as the project. Um, can you tell us how far they are away from the applicant's property? Um, not very far. They're right around the bend on the other side of Tanner Drive. Okay. Um, did they receive a written notice from the applicant of the hearing? I believe they did, but I'm not positive of that. Okay. Ms. Kearney, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, and Mr. Buck, if you know, do you know what parcel number they own? Because the way that B4 is set forth, it does indicate parcel numbers. Uh, no, I don't. I just, they're at 140, Cherie. I don't know which parcel number that is. Um, I normally, Mr. Freed, make objections to anyone who has it to standing, to anyone who hasn't received the notice. So I'm not quite sure because some of the properties, the addresses are like in Horsham and stuff. So it's unclear. I don't have a 140 Sherry Boulevard on my list for B4. Um, I'm trying to look it up real quick. <laughs> we can also, I mean, uh, Tara, if you're able to find it quickly, that's fine. If not, we can reserve ruling on that and we can determine what the, um, what the parcel number is to determine if the applicant has any objection. Yeah, I mean, um, 33.4-30.4, they are not on the list because they're not immediately abutting. Are you able, um, Mr. Buck, or is your client able to estimate how far um, their property is from the, the applicant's property? Mm. Trying to get a there's scale. One, the, there's one property in between um, Tanner Drive and 140. And that, and that is the parcel 33.4 30.10. I mean, it, I, maybe 150 feet, something like that, on a, if my scale, if my scale on this map is right. I mean, it looks like maybe 150 to 200 feet off the easternmost piece of the property. And actually, maybe even a little closer if you go up towards the north. Ms. Kearney, do you have an objection? Uh just, Mr. Freed, normally I object if they haven't been given notice. Again, I, I'll, I'll reiterate, though, that obviously we'll listen to any of the comments or questions and take that into consideration, and the applicant will certainly work with the um, DBT. 
EFT, I apologize, EFT. All right, get, yeah. given that we're a bit of a, a little unique, normally we probably have a map up and we yeah. could look and everyone could see exactly how far we are. I'm gonna reserve uh, judgment on the determination of, of your second client, which shouldn't affect you, I don't believe tonight, because obviously you'll still have the ability to, to cross-examine and, and participate, uh, Mr. Buck. So, um, and we'll hopefully be able by the, the next, uh, I'm a, I'm, I know I'm jumping ahead, but my understanding is there may be another night at least of hearing. So certainly by the next hearing, we'll be able to make a, a determination on that. Okay, thank you. Are there any other parties or uh, individuals or entities uh, present tonight that would like to seek party status? All right, I am not seeing any. Um, So with that, um, Ms. Carey, I will turn it over to the applicant. Thank you. And as um, your solicitor had indicated, uh, the applicant here is here tonight for conditional use relief for certain items in your zoning ordinance. The use itself, the distribution warehouse is a permitted use and the office use associated with the distribution warehouse is also a permitted use. What we're here for is conditional use for what I'll consider dimensional items. One, for the height, and two, for the, um, if you're over 40,000 square feet of a non-residential building and have 200 parking spaces, that's a distinct conditional use also, um, as indicated by Mr. Free for the park. Um, however, in the review letter by the township engineer, he did indicate that if the park is open to the public, we do not need a conditional use for the actual park and uh, Mr. Nielsen will be testifying that the intent is to have that park open to the public. Um, also, we needed relief for the extension of time similar to Vanguard. It's under the section 806.4L um, in order to construct in phases the um, three distribution warehouse centers. We have four witnesses for um, the hearing tonight. The first witness would be John Nielsen, who's a representative of the applicant. Kestra Kelly, who's from BL Companies, an engineer. The traffic engineer from Traffic Planning and Design, Eric Ostemchuk. And finally, David Babbitt, who's a land planner. And I did receive um, that Mr. Babbitt had received Mr. Ott's review of his fiscal impact. So he, we are aware of it and um, we can accept it as a exhibit B15. Um, Mr. Fried, that'll be made, I'm sorry, thank you. That'll be made part of the record as well. Thank you. I'm not sure if you wanna uh, swear them all in at once or you wanna do it one at a time. Uh, whatever, if they're gonna be, uh, however you wanna do it, if they're gonna be testifying one at a time, we can just swear them in one at a time. That's fine. I'll ask that Mr. Nielsen be sworn in. And Mr. Buck, just, just so I'm clear, uh, until uh, we rule otherwise, you can, you can ask questions on behalf of both your clients. Thank you. Got it. Mr. Nielsen, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And John, can you spell your uh, last name for the court reporter? Yes, it's N-E-I-L-S-O-N. -E and can you describe by whom you are employed? I'm employed by Audubon Land Development Corp. And can you briefly describe to the board who you are? I'm the president of a 58-year-old family uh, real estate development company that does uh, multiple disciplines of development and management in uh, residential, uh, industrial, retail, hospitality, and senior housing. Some of our projects include Shenandoah Retirement Community, um, the Greater Philly Expo in Oaks, um, 
many uh, industrial buildings, about 5 million square feet uh, of industrial, um, five hotels. Uh, and so we've been at this a long time. We're a um, multi-generational, multi-generational, three generations in the business now, and a fourth little crowd coming up, but they're a little young yet to attend these meetings. So, but we've been at this, uh, like I said, 58 years. I've been doing this about 40 years. And one of the exhibits that um, is shown on the table of contents that we're viewing is the redacted agreement of sale between Nelson Realty Trust, which is Vanguard, and Audubon Management Corp uh, for the four properties that are the subject of the conditional use application. And that would be exhibit tab seven, correct? That's correct. Okay. Yes. And that agreement of sale is still in place and is still um, active, correct? That's correct. And can you explain your relationship to Audubon Management Corp, which is the equitable owner of the property and the applicant before the board? I am the president of that company as well. And Audubon Land Development Corp was listed as the developer in the conditional use application. Can you explain what that company is and who you are to that company? We use a development company. It's our own development company uh, called Audubon Land Development. I am the president of that company as well. And um, if we could bring up the conditional use plan, can you explain for the board and the neighbors what you are proposing? Yes, that would be exhibit two. Oh, no. Plan one, exhibit two. You could actually go to that other slides. Uh, if, if Is it in there? It's in that group, yeah, right there. there. The first slide there. Uh, and I can reference them in by number as opposed to the exhibit, that is exhibit two. Uh, this is the plan that uh, we developed. Um, my daughter Amber and I had, after we uh, were successful in um, convincing Vanguard that you know we were a uh, someone who would be responsible in the community and uh, with some history and many disciplines of development, um, we entered into an agreement in August of uh, 2019. And my daughter and I, Amber, attended just about every possible meeting the township had from the parks board, the planning commission, board of supervisors, um, uh, environmental advisory council, industrial development authority, um, historical commission, sewer board, um, comprehensive plan committee, com a community day committee, pretty much tried to get a real good understanding of what, how the community functions, uh, how they operate um, and what's important to them. And uh, I think that's, an integral part of, of any development program um, is that you understand you know the neighborhood that you're working in and how it impacts that. And so after after many in-person meetings, uh, obviously we um, had been listening carefully to the comprehensive plan meetings, and there was some discussion uh, at the meetings about some residential opportunity. And after a number of meetings, um, they concluded that in fact this site was best served to continue to remain in the PIC zoning district. So with that in mind, um, we started to look for opportunities in that uh, zoning ordinance. Just about that exact time, the pandemic started and um, that created a whole nother host of challenges. And in the early days was obviously very concerning. But one of the things that we quickly learned is that we, uh, because of uh, e-commerce, uh, last mile distribution, onshoring and nearshoring, as a result of that, um, there were supply chain issues. I think all of us experienced them at some level. And so there was this measurable surge in the uh, desire to have distribution facilities at that time. And, um, and then you tack on top of that, that we all had to learn, um, you know, what I'll call it the technology adaptation curve what would have taken 10 years with e-commerce and, you know, eventually saying, yeah, I'll buy online. Um, that condensed to six months. And that even put more pressure on the desire for distribution. So we studied the distribution market. We, from our own experiences and with the 5 million feet that we manage and own now, a couple of them are a million foot buildings. Um, we saw this demand and we thought, you know, if we can do a good job up here, build class A uh, distribution warehouses, um, and, you know, and uh, provide the, you know, 45%, uh, well, actually it's 35%, but in this case, it's 45% what we designed um, for the distribution facilities. We then 
I said, you know, after listening to all the park board meetings, the EAC meetings, we thought, you know, we're going to, I think we could do a real nice park there on that corner and maintain the general character of Sherry Boulevard and Route 100 uh, with a lot of greenways from, you know, pretty much the whole corner uh, of the property is going to be utilized as, as a park. And I can get into more t details about that later, but essentially that's how we came up with this plan. And then we went through the process of understanding, okay, well, what do you, how do you get there? And uh, that's where this conditional use process uh, took us. So um, that's really how we got to this point. And then uh, what we have next is, uh, the next slides are, what are these class A buildings gonna look like? That's the first thing people are gonna wanna know. These are not your typical tin sided warehouses. These are truly the class A model that the top tenants in the country wanna see. And in order to attract them, you have to create this uh, really um, first class environment with through architecture, landscaping, um, buffering, um, you know, just a complete package to say, hey, we want to we want to come here. We want to be part of this uh, property. And the proximity to the turnpike can't be understated. It's it's a huge issue to them to be their major arterials. So given what we want to do in terms of the architecture and the location, we think we have a great recipe to attract first class tenants to Euclid Township. I want to slide down just to give it a little flavor of the different building types. Again, you know, not, not tin, architectural breaks in the building, you know, facades above that run above the roof line to try to create some dimensional breaks in the building. Continue on down. This is, you know, standing back more on the side where you'd see some, some uh, you know, the transportation vehicles, the trucks, and of course the office building on the side. Again, just another example of some of the architecture uh, that uh, we want to see put there. The main reason for this isn't so much the architecture, but given the location of the uh, building A along the turnpike, we will be raising along Route 100. So what I was trying to show here is that there'll be a wall built along the frontage of this building along Route 100. Um, and that's really what this is to show that, that wall presentation. And John, these were the um, the architectural renderings that we had shown to the Planning Commission, correct? They are, yeah. All these plans have been seen by the Planning Commission. I went through these with the um, Historical Commission um, and, uh, you know, showed these various plans to them and gotten uh, generally positive feedback, including unanimous uh, recommendations for the Historical Commission, as well as the uh, Planning Commission some recommendations from the EAC. The park board was taking it under advisement, but seemed very enthused about the idea. And you're willing to work with the township on the architecture as part of the land development process? I, absolutely. Right? I think the blend of architecture, landscaping, um, walls, uh, uh, you know, berms, all to create a pleasant streetscape. We've done some, um, some streetscapes um, further down, I think that would be, well, let, we could stop at the park quick. I'll just give you, a, okay, you can, can, all right, that's fine right there. So, so this is kind of a blow up of the park area. My thoughts here were that, again, most of the parks in the township, there's about a dozen of them, um, and they primarily uh, are centered around sports related, active, uh, engaged, you know, sports for children. And I'm certainly not against that. I think they're wonderful community builders and I've been a huge fan. All my kids went through the, the program. So, uh, you know, I, I can appreciate the need. However, I think in this location, given you have such a large portion of the sports uh, handled in a lot of your other parks, I thought with the historical buildings that are on this site, which are shown in the upper part of the screen, um, with the environmental sensitive nature of this area of the property um, that you could blend the passive type recreation activities, maybe a dog park um, and tie into the existing walking trail that borders along Sherry Boulevard, about a mile uh, walk there, have electric charging stations given its proximity to the turnpike and major thoroughfares. So you come in there, charge your car, walk your dog, take a walk around the, the uh, area you know, 
utilize native plants, um, kind of like what Tony was talking about earlier in the meeting for those that were on. She gave a good example of some of the things that can be done. Balancing the maintenance needs of the township, I think is really important. We don't want to create a maintenance nightmare for the township. We're interested in um, utilizing areas uh, into more native species where there's less maintenance. Uh, and, and a number of the things that, that she mentioned, uh, rain gardens and you know butterfly uh, habitats, um, add all those to it, park benches, more of a passive nature. So our goal here is to create something the township can be proud of. I realize that there's a uh, development behind it, but I also feel to take advantage of these, all these blends of interests in this area in 30 acres, which doesn't come easy in, in the township today, as opposed to just keeping an open space would be a positive asset to the community. And if you slide up one more slide, it just gives a kind of a flavor of uh, what, we're, what, we're, what we're looking at um, in terms of you know, a trail, some a, a park naming, we'll have to come up with a name. I really would like to blend the, the historical group, the um, EAC, the planning commission, the park board and the township in, in conversation to say, what can we do here to be really special? How can we blend the environment, educate, historical preservation, energy management uh, and renewables? How can we blend that into a, into a nice a walkable passive area? And uh, that's my goal. Obviously the picture on the lower left was pre COVID, but uh, as it turns out, you know, hopefully that'll all be the storm that passes and we'll be on with the business at hand to have some fun out there uh, and celebrate, you know, us being back together again when we get past this. So that's pretty much the park. Uh, the next section, the next group of slides include, uh, which I guess would be exhibits uh, 12, are streetscapes from various angles of the property. So this, this pr uh, angle is from uh, route, uh, 100, you're actually in the northbound lane. This depicts uh, the barn and the silo. I don't quite see the silo in this, uh, in this picture, but it is there uh, in, in the previous one. Maybe you got to reduce it a little bit. Yeah, okay, there's one with the thing. Did I do that? Yep, it's, it's better now. You just have to come over to the left. Anyway, that, that ramp that you see is what we're hoping will be the ramp onto the turnpike. The welcome to Euclid, we can do whatever the township wants. I've been having come here for a year. That silo has some magic in this township. Uh, you know, people say, you know where the silo is. And I guess that, so we were just using it more of a, uh, as a, uh, you know, a site area that uh, is an identifier to, to, to Euclid Township. Um, the, obviously the historic buildings will be restored and uh, renovated. Uh, in the background, you see the largest uh, building um, building A. And if you look in the upper right corner, you can see where that picture is taken from. I, I can't quite see the whole uh, picture, but it should be there. This is, see the arrow on the plan. That's where the picture is taken from. That's the angle that you can see. Next slide. So this, this is looking at the larger building, uh, the building A uh, coming north on 100, looking from an angle shown on the arrow plan there. And then the next slide is really the park plan, looking at the park. Now in this particular diagram, we, we have a little bit too much of maintenance in this, but we certainly intend to work with the groups that I mentioned to to minimize that maintenance cost so that truly there's a benefit here to the township with as, as minimal cost as possible. And then the last slide from a street view is at the corner of Sherry Boulevard and Route 100. And John, let me, let me uh, uh, go back to the park and um, the intent with the park is to make it available for public use, correct? That, that is correct, yes, we are, we are we believe that uh, you know, bringing the community together is, is a part of the fabric of any community. And uh, truly that uh, this is another one of those uh, assets and amenities that the township can add to their list of you know, really great uh, amenities already um, in a little different setting, in a little different programming, um, but also in, enjoyed, can be enjoyed by you know, all the residents and passerbys as well. 
And uh, you had indicated about the historic structures and um, the applicant is willing to preserve the same historic structures that Vanguard intended to preserve as part of its conditional use, correct? Yes, I am. I, uh, I've studied what they did. I've looked at the properties. There's some really good assets there. There's a couple that, you know, obviously need some help. Um, but yes, we definitely want to preserve, maintain, uh, and do exactly what Vanguard did and bring them up to a level where the town can be proud of, of the product uh, of taking history and bringing it back to life. And uh, I think you may have indicated this already. You're agreeable to working with the Historical, historical Commission in preference. Absolutely. I've been attending their meetings and regularly and um, even through the pandemic and uh, keeping up to speed. And um, the views that those views that we had just gone through, those viewscape renderings, you had shown them to the Planning Commission also, correct? I did, yes. And then can you explain why Audubon Management Corp is proposing the use of the distribution warehouse? Yeah, I think I think, you know, in in to sum it up, um, I would say that it serves the regional and local needs especially in today's e-commerce and, and supply chain issues, there's a huge demand for uh, onshoring and, and correcting these issues that have been developed as a result of e-commerce. It's created this uh, big demand. It's a permitted use. Obviously you have you know, conditional use for the size and the parking and the height, but essentially these uses are in high demand, especially along major arterials. And I uh, just wanted to ask you, there's gonna be no bulk storage of liquid or gaseous fuels except for consumption on the premises, correct? There will not. And the applicant will meet all building code requirements, including that the buildings must be fully sprinklered. That is correct. And I think you were up to, can you just describe for the board and the neighbors where the proposed use will be located? Yeah. At, I think we have an aerial and the depth, yes. we have the zoning map and the aerial to show. So if you look at the zoning map, um, the property is pretty much in the center of that uh, circle there uh, along Sherry Boulevard, the turnpike. So about 82% of our frontage is, is surrounded by property either we own or is the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Turnpike's about half of our frontage. Um, and then as you come around the Turnpike and go down Route 100, we own the property in gray on there, on the, on the opposite side of Route 100. In addition to that, we own the property on Sherry Boulevard all the way up to the JW Pepper building on the corner. So there's about 16% of our property that, that would be fronting uh, or across the street from or bordering uh, our, our, our warehouse distribution facilities. All of which um, tells me that we wanna do a really good job being thoughtful of the neighborhood, uh, including JW Pepper, which we, we spoke to today. Uh, and we want to make sure that we uh, minimize those impacts uh, visually uh, and also with uh, trip generation, which Eric from TPD will get into those uh, next. And also we want to do the same for the Chester Book Academy, which is in the pink uh, inside the circle. Um, we would, we're about 300, about a football field length away from their building. We're about a football length away from the edge of Sherry Boulevard across from Pepper and about 550 feet uh, away from their building with building. Um, on our side of the road, we're about 130 feet to a parking lot um, where, the, uh, where the trucks would be. And we are intending to, in that 100 feet or 130 feet, we're intending to do landscaping to actually sit with the uh, neighboring folks uh, and go through our uh, landscape plan. We have a landscape architect on, on, uh, on this project. And we wanna come up with a way to minimize uh, any view shed that they might have as relates to the trucks and trucking. Obviously the building you're gonna see, but we believe the architecture there, which we'll be happy to share with them, will in itself share um, a positive uh, view, uh, maybe not the same as a cornfield, but certainly uh, with proper landscaping and, and uh, buffering and berming, fencing, if appropriate, uh, we think we can do a really good job to, to maintain 
a, uh, a good looking view shed across that area. In addition to that, all along Cherry Boulevard, we start with the park and then we carry that greenway, like I said, down to 130 feet right up across from the uh, JW Pepper building. And if you go to the next slide, Tara, I think we um, may have discussed most of this, John, but this was the um, aerial. Yeah, we thought it was important to understand what's around the area. If you look at if you look at the area, the township had in mind. Now, the, the PI is obviously you can see industrial buildings um, in, in that area there. The uh, PIC they just did a 423,000. There was a 250, and they expanded it by 185,000 right across Sherry Boulevard, directly into this site. There, USCC has a 423,000 square foot uh, complex uh, where they are manufacturing and obviously shipping. Um, out of that location directly across Sherry Boulevard from, from uh, where we're going to be proposing these distribution facilities. So what you see there is a band all along the turnpike of uh, industrial, uh, flex, office, retail, uh, you know, one-story, multi-story office, and then some uh, what I would call accessory services that would serve that need, like daycare, which is, uh, you know, not uncommon to have where you have a big employment base. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. So while we're on this plan, can I just point out this is the DFT building right here? Okay. Thank you. And, and I have, I have a, just a quick question, Ms. Kearney. Th these 14 slides, are they marked as exhibits? Yes, we sent them over. They're all exhibits in my table of contents. And I think John was saying them as he was going through them. Uh, we sent them over as a separate um, download because uh, the, the Dropbox was so large because of the lighting. Right. It made it hard to go through it. So yes, everything that John was testifying to, you'll see the additional use plan is exhibit two. The facade examples are all listed in exhibit 13. The park, okay. the park sketch was exhibit 14. The park design concepts was 15. The viewscapes were all in Exhibit 12. The, uh, the township zoning map was Exhibit 10. And the aerial was Exhibit 11. It just made it a little bit easier to send it as a separate download, because this one's very large. Thank you. Yes. So the other thing on this area is that there's the heights of these buildings. You know, we're, we're looking at about a 50-foot height uh, on our buildings. Uh, we could go as high as 65 with, uh, by reducing our impervious. So you have a built-in formula in the township. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of examples of 50 plus foot buildings uh, in that area. Uh, certainly the, uh, there's Exton Commons there, there's, there's, uh, which is a five-story building. There's hotels that are all five-story plus buildings. Um, and it uh, wouldn't be uncommon to see a 50-foot structure in, in that, what I would call, corridor there of... Um, industrial uses. John, do you have a specific end user at this time for the distribution warehouse? We do not. Um, typically, these are planned. You got to get a little bit further along in the planning process because uh, they, they want to see that you've got traction um, before they're willing to commit. There's, the demand is such that they don't want to hope to get something. They got to know they can get, to, get in there and get in there at a certain time frame. Uh, so we, we don't have anybody identified. We certainly talked to a few, but uh, we've said that we got to get a little bit further along in the process so that we can commit to your uh, build date. And um, could you also address working with the EAC as to renewable energy and solar capabilities? Absolutely. Uh, the EAC's review letter is strongly recommending that we take a look at the possibility of renewables uh, on the site. Uh, to help with their Euclid 100 plan, you know, trying to, I, I don't know if it's Euclid, but it's the county is trying to be 100% renewable. Uh, given the uh, rooftops here, um, we have gone through um, with other projects, namely the Expo Center, we're in a pilot project right now to build uh, a 500,000 uh, watt facility on the Expo Center, uh, which we could take up to 2 million watt. With these rooftops, what we're gonna do is um, when we pick an architect 
for the buildings, we intend to make sure that they design the structures so that we can manage and maintain the roof loads that would be required for solar installation. Um, again, we're, we're involved in many ways in renewables. We have two, uh, you know, three megawatt uh, windmills uh, that produce electric. Now they're in New York uh, and in Pennsylvania. They're not as friendly, but we've gotten contacted by many solar companies who want to do solar installations on, uh, on the ground. And I think there's no better place than put them on the building where you could use them. Uh, and so we really are excited about that opportunity. Pennsylvania just needs to do a few things. My understanding is they're working on them, but it's not there yet. When it does cross that threshold, we'll be the first ones to line up uh, for solar opportunities on these roofs. And John, one of the considerations in the conditional use ordinance is whether the proposed use will constitute an appropriate use in the area and will not injure or detract from the use of surrounding properties or from the character of their neighborhood. Can you explain how the applicant will address this? Yes, I, I, I feel that we will, we will definitely, uh, it's, it's a permitted use. We're definitely in an area um, which has no residences that border the property. Uh, not one. And uh, it's an area that is business friendly. Um, and I, I feel that this use is to see an office building there would be very difficult today. You know, with the way we're working these days, uh, office is, is certainly not, not the favored uh, real estate type. There's a one story office building adjacent to the across the street from Chester uh, Brook that is, there's an awful lot of vacancy in there. Now the self storage, that's pretty jammed. But uh, the office is, is pretty, uh, pretty lean right now. Um, and I think learning this new language with uh, digital technology, um, with the remote working, uh, we're not convinced that that will come back. However, we all need goods. And trucking is, is the fabric of our nation. If you think about it, it's, it's how we get all our goods, using trucks. And this site is, couldn't be better positioned for that use and is consistent with the permission, permitted uses in the PIC. And I think we just want to put a lot of dressing and Christmas bows on it to make it look really good in the, in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, probably the, the, the thing that comes up and, and having talking to uh, JW Pepper is the, is the trucks. And I think, think Eric will, will do a good job explaining what that looks like, what those numbers look like, how that actually um, will play into this site um, and uh, how we'll try to mitigate uh, any any significant impact on uh, on those neighbors that we have there on uh, Sherry Boulevard. And the, the applicant has sufficient land to be able to provide um, effective screening on the, on the property. Absolutely. We have 70 feet on our property that we can do to protect uh, the Cheshire Brook. 70 feet, we can do fences, berms, walls, sound walls, landscaping. We can completely protect their um, their interests there, uh, as far as the, uh, neighbor directly across the street. Um, we certainly can, we have about 130 feet. I'll call it a hundred. Again, you can do a lot of protection, uh, in a hundred feet. If they don't want to see anything, uh, at least at ground level, that's pretty easy to do. Um, you know, we can, we're certainly willing to sit with them, have designers work with them, do a first class job to try to minimize the impacts there. And uh, you'll do that as part of the land development process, work with both the neighbors and the township. Uh, absolutely. And John, I, before I ask so, some of my final questions, I didn't want to let go by the bicycle um, issue that had come up at the Planning Commission because you had wanted to address that. Yeah, I do. I do. I think it's important. You know, when some of the residents in the area, while it's not a very residential area that we're talking about, they have a high level of interest in, in bicycles. And now that we add a park to it, I think it even enhances their desires. And uh, so as part of the process, part of the land development process, we fully intend to provide a safe um, bicycle access through Sherry Boulevard uh, and to the park uh, is, as part of our development program. We will, again, we can work with them, uh, the township uh, or those groups that have interest in making sure there's a safe uh, bicycle thoroughfare through the Sherry Boulevard. And one of the other things I wanted to um, ask you about was um, you had previously testified in reference to, I believe, the, um, and I'm not sure if you did or you didn't, but the worker shifts uh, that would occur at the distribution facilities. Yeah. So, you know, 
every tenant is different. I couldn't say for certainty that everyone will be 24 seven, but uh, these guys, uh, the, the trucking community doesn't like to be on the road during peak hours. That's, that's a big negative to their capacity to move goods. So their 4 a.m. starts um, and they like to be on the dock, um, you know, while everybody else is getting to, to work uh, so that the workers that come in here, they, you know, get into their, into their inside the building and start, you know, sorting and getting the goods distributed through the various uh, truck docks that are, exist on the property. So essentially they are, uh, they try to work outside that typical workday peak hour trips where Vanguard had somewhere around 5,000 uh, car trips. You know, we're talking 380 total trips and, and truck trips of in the 70s. I mean, it's, it's very small compared to what Vanguard was going to do here in terms of traffic impact. And um, as part of the conditional use application that we had filed, we had uh, provided the aqua water availability letter, which is marked as exhibit tab five and the sewer capacity agreement marked as exhi exhibit tab six. And can you explain just briefly what those state? Sure, uh, basically there's plenty of sewer capacity. Uh, Vanguard had reserved uh, 98,000 uh, gallons a day in the Eagle View sewer treatment plant. Uh, and they've been paying for that capacity since, I don't know, for 15 years probably. Uh, and they also had a commitment from the DARA treatment plant uh, for 22,000 gallons. So there's actually way more sewer than we need, but uh, for, the, for the uses that we're doing, we're expecting 1,500 employees. They were looking at uh, somewhere in the magnitude of 10 or 12,000 employees. I know their initial 2,000 plan had 12,000 cars of parking and uh, about 2.4 million square feet on this site. So it was a much greater scale of employees on that site than what we're proposing. And on uh, one of the conditional use criteria is in reference to the environmental um, issues on the site. And can you just address that? Yeah, um, you know, we obviously looked, it's, it's confidential. We have a confidential reality agreement with Vanguard. So we have to be very careful about what we uh, disclose without their permission. Um, I did show them our plans for the site and they were, were, were satisfied that what we were gonna do there worked for them. Um, we're not, we have no uh, concerns about the environmental on the property whatsoever. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly through the land development process, we're happy to share all that. I just need to get permission to, uh, to do that. And uh, in the beginning, as we indicated, we were asking pursuant to section 806.4 L, the applicant, applicant is requesting extension of time to complete destruction of the proposed uh, distribution warehouse facilities. Can you give a timeline or, or phasing of how that will be done? Yeah, so typically um, what I've seen in this particular size uh, building is that they would build probably one building, possibly building A first as a spec building if there's not a tenant in hand. Uh, obviously, if there's a tenant in hand, you know, my, my order could be off. But then you would go to the second building and third buildings as a tenant arrives. Um, you know, to say that 12 months it can be done, it's, it's just not feasible. So I would be uh, asking if it'd be possible to extend the uh, approval timeline to 10 years if possible. I know Vanguard had 15, but there's a little, little bit bigger uh, project. Um, I'd like to request a 10 year um, approval extension if possible. That's all the questions I, I had of Mr. Nielsen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Buck. Thank you. Let me get unmuted here. Uh, just a few questions. Uh, good evening, Mr. Nielsen. Hi, Mr. Buck. Um, so you were talking about before, so your company has developed, or your company right now manages, what, roughly 5 million square feet of industrial use? That's correct. And is that... Did your company develop that, purchase it? We have done mostly purchases of industrial property and redevelopment. And I have to tell you, redevelopment is a lot more difficult than starting from a ground up set of plans. It's easy to design and build. We built, you know, Shannondale's millions of feet of space ground up. Um, 
so we definitely have experience in construction for 50 plus years. Uh, and that's the easy part. The redevelopment gets tough. You come in with a lot of different uh, objections when you're trying to redevelop. Right. And, and so how much um, ground up industrial development has your company done roughly? Uh, you mean brand new? We, yeah. we have not built a building this size ground up yet. We've redeveloped two million footers. One's a million two and the other one's a million. Uh, one in Reading and one in Oaks. Okay. Um, and on the uh, drawings that were up, can, Tara, can you pull up the um, renderings that Mr. Nielsen was referring to? Which ones? Yeah, uh, one, I think one or two before that one. No, I, it, it was the uh, landscape views of the, oh yeah, that, yeah. So Mr. Nielsen, tell, where is that? You said that's the big building, the initial? Oh, no, 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 this isn't our site. This isn't right. our site at all. This is a site that was developed up in Northampton. This was only uh, shown for the wall, to show the wall, because we will have a wall on Route 100 side of the uh, Building A. Okay, and, and Building A will be relatively close to the Route 100. Uh, it's about the same it? distance that Vanguard's building was. We checked that. Uh, we, okay. Somebody asked that question previously, and we answered that. Uh, it was about the same distance. Okay. Has any thought been given to the, um, oh, I'm sorry, if you could pull up the general, the general conditional use plan that shows the, over it, thank you. Um, has thought been given, obviously, the, um, the, the significant concern from the neighbor's point of view, and just everybody's, the, the people are not opposed to development here. Everybody knows that something's going to win there. What they just want to see is, is good and smart development that uses the infrastructure uh, that's there wisely. Has, you know, and Cherie Boulevard essentially ends up being the access drive for uh, the entire million nine square feet of building. Um, and the traffic study, which we can get into in a little bit with your traffic engineer, seems to say that. Uh, the direct connection to the turnpike is not is preferred but not necessary. Do, do you agree with that or do you think that access is a, a necessary uh, part of a plan of this scope and size? I, I certainly feel, I think we did the, uh, I think I, I'm, I'm certain that we did the study so as if we're unable to get it, that the traffic still works. From my perspective, working with the customer who's what's really important here the people that and the truckers that have to use this site uh, to be able to use that access and not have to wind through the site again would be a huge advantage so i will give it everything i have to try to get that done through pendot through the turnpike i think it makes so much sense it's so logical and it takes traffic off sherry boulevard which again vanguard was going to have thousands of cars on that. We're talking in the hundreds uh, of trucks, not thousands. Right, right. Well, it's still, the numbers in the, in the uh, traffic study, depending on what type of warehouse it is, are in the 340 peak hour range. That includes both cars and trucks. Most of, only 20% of that number is car is trucks. That's total vehicle trips. So we're only talking maybe 70. Now, and, I, and actually, Eric is much better to answer those questions. Yeah. Um, so the 340 number, uh, you know, you could, if you thought it was trucks, that that's just not the case. And Eric can help clarify that as well. I think that's a really important point um, for, for your clients. Uh, to understand just the volume of trucks there. I think he told me, I think there was four trucks or something that are expected to go out uh, onto Euclid Avenue. Something very small, but he'd be better off to answer that question. Okay, what, what you, four trucks for what? I think peak hour trips, four. Why would you have 
I don't, I don't want to. I, I want to make sure that he he answers these questions, not myself. I, yeah. I had listened to all that because I thought it was important. As you know, I want to understand the neighborhood, and I want to make yeah. sure we're listening to the neighborhood. Understood. That's fine. No, understood. Um, and we can get into this with Eric as well. But has consideration um, been given to uh, moving? the mid-size warehouse building to the west so that it's closer to the arterial road of Route 100 and the, the park is sort of in the middle and the park is not on a busy highway? Yeah, the challenge with that is the historical structures. So again, trying to balance those historical structures uh, need to remain. Um, and there's also environmental constraints as you continue to shift to the west. So, um, it would be difficult to move that building down because of that. What, what are the, the historical structures? There's a couple all the way to the northwest. What are the historical structures that need to be preserved? Are you talking the farmhouse? The farmhouse and the barn. Yep. There's a barn up on the left. Uh, they're, they're actually right in the center of building B. That, those ones in the center, those are the ones that need to be preserved. And the house, the, the house, the main house is right, to, right there. So that was the challenge. And then if you squeeze it too tight, you know, to me, you take away from the park. Uh, and that's why we were, uh, that's why the building is where it is. Okay. Um, and then the access points on Cherie, and obviously everybody can see, everybody knows what Cherie looks like and how it's designed and um, the movements on that road. Has consideration been given to having the primary access point come out on 100? The exit, uh, as we talked about earlier, yes. Uh, the, the entrance, um, I guess we could certainly look at that. And as, as I, I'm not closed minded about if there's a better option, uh, I'm certainly willing to look at that. If that's something that makes good traffic planning sense for the community at large, I have no problem to look at that option. I think we can direct most of the truck traffic in at the uh, first entrance uh, through signage uh, and get them into the site to serve the two larger buildings. Now, the 150,000 foot building in the back, I think you're, that building that she pointed out, I thought was around, a, I don't know, maybe 100,000. Um, but the one all the way to the right, um, my, my thoughts there is you probably would, some of the trucks would probably go up to, the, to, to that location as opposed to the, uh, the first location. But through signage, I think a lot of the truck traffic uh, could, could turn right there and not even get to your property, uh, which you know obviously is is a benefit. Now you know Eric can, again can speak on that. And if we're successful in getting that turnpike entrance, I think we really cut the load down. Mr. Buck, just out of curiosity, about how much more do you think you have? Uh, just a couple minutes. Okay, then just we'll uh, after after you're finished up, we'll we'll take a short break and then come back and okay that's fine thank you um all right yeah um and actually this is more traffic related but i know there's uh messages coming in what has, and we didn't see any reference to this in the traffic study, and if, if this is more appropriate for Eric, that's fine, but, you know, everybody in the area thinks it's pretty much a, a foregone conclusion that a lot of the trucks, instead of going through there, will end up going down to one, 100 to 113 and back up into Sherry that way. Has, was that taken into consideration in the traffic study at all, the movements down? You know, I, I, I best not answer that uh, because I just don't know that I can answer it 
with certainty. So why don't we let Eric answer that question? They did the overall traffic study um, and uh, best he answered that. That's fine. Okay. No, no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Sure. Thanks. Why don't we take a, take a, I would normally say a 10 minute break, but we're again, let's take a, a, a 10 minute break. Give everyone a, a chance to give the court reporter a chance to, to catch a breath and uh, then we'll come back with the oh. board will ask some questions and then we can redirect. Sounds good. Thanks. So we'll start, we'll be back at, um, well, let's say, let's say uh, 9.55.
Everybody back? Yes. How's our court reporter doing? I'm hanging in there, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, okay, back on the record. Um, does the board have any questions? I did. Um, this is Kim. I did. What What is the distance between Building A and Route 100? I know that Mr. Nielsen said same distance as Vanguard, but I wasn't here when that original plan was proposed. So about what a, is about, that? A, about a football field, about 330 feet. Thank you. About a football field. And um, I know you said you're, you stated the warehouse would be built in terms of square feet. Can, do you, but you don't have clients yet. Do you space, do you partition out the warehouse based on your, I guess, business agreement with the clients or do you have set, I guess I'm asking, will three companies go in? Will 10 companies, clients go in? Like, like how do you decide and how do you know? Like, That's a good, good question. Yeah, uh, typically uh, building A, there are users that want a um, bigger footprint and they may take the whole building. But in many cases, especially in our redevelopment portfolio, we've done a lot of multi-tenant building. So could there be three tenants there? Yes. My suspicion is building A will not be more than one tenant. Uh, if, if you asked me today, my best professional opinion would be there would be uh, one tenant. You said that you expect 1,640 workers there. How did you get that estimate? Uh, we used uh, Dave Babbitt, who's our consultant, to study what they use in other uh, uses like this, and uh, that's how he derived that number. Is there an algorithm or formula you can offer? I think Dave Babbitt would be that he did the yeah. fiscal impact analysis and he would be able to tell you how he derived that number. It's, it's sort of laid out in the fiscal impact analysis. So then we're talking about anywhere from 70 to 100 trucks a day plus four, 1,640 workers a day. That was peak hour, but I think, I think he may be on next to answer your questions about trucks um, coming in and out of the site. Uh, the workers are typically would, there would be multiple shifts, not just one shift. Okay. And this is a 24 hour operation of facility. In, in most cases they are. Sometimes they do reduce the number of workers overnight. Um, but yes, it would be anticipated that it would be uh, used uh, 24 hours. You. I'll say for the building A and B. I'm not going to say that for building C. It's hard to say. But the, the definitely the A and B building, the chances are that will be a 24-hour. Is there another facility along um, Route 100 or uh, the Turnpike that would be similar to this that could give us an idea of how that would operate? There's definitely a number of examples of these types of buildings. Uh, Route 100, the only one I can think of would be all the way up near Route 78. There's a lot of them up there. Um, it's hard to get the ground to do this uh, type of use like, along a major arterial. So an example really close, uh, I'd have to do some thinking, um, but uh, up on 78 uh, and the challenge there, they're all over the place. So you, you kind of want to go into an area where there's, like you, like this is where it's just, one group of buildings as opposed to many millions of feet. All right, thank you. Anything else, Ms. Gunn? No, I'm finished, thank you. Mr. Miller, Ms. Bauman? So, um, oh, Ms. Bauman, do you wanna go first? I thought I heard you. Uh, I was going to ask about, and maybe this is, 
maybe this is for the uh, traffic traffic um, part of this, but uh, you, you were talking about the bicyclist going down Cherry Boulevard and um, but and I appreciate that you're trying to make the ride down the Sherry Boulevard and into the into the proposed park would be much uh, much safer, uh, or at least as safe as it is now. What I'm actually concerned about is I go a little further down and crossing over 100 uh, when you're increasing the amount of traffic, including truck uh, truck traffic. Um, and if we have to make any, if there's any modifications that need to be made to that intersection, it's already very. I, I cross that section somewhat regularly. Um, I know uh, on foot, I know that it's already a tricky intersection. Um, and can you, and I know some of this can be handled um, in land development, but I do want to know what you're thinking uh, in terms of, of how, how that particular aspect of the, of the route would be, would be taken care of. Yeah, I think uh, Eric would certainly be better to answer the, the, the cycle timing and the various things that, that allow that to happen, that crossing. But I think in time uh, with other, development ground that we have in the area, what I'd like to see is a blend of um, a potentially even a pedestrian uh, bridge across, um, but I, I wouldn't want to commit it for this project. But as we look to future projects there, it's possible that it may make sense to do that. And it may make sense to make a contribution towards that. Uh, even now with, with, with what we're doing, we viewed our contribution now as the park uh, and, and really developing a first class, a passive uh, environmental right. park. Yeah. But absolutely, uh, as we look further down the road, possibly modem modal funds where we would be a, the contributor of the 30% uh, to come up with some way to, to make a safe crossing when it's warranted. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure when that is, but certainly we're willing to, we're willing to listen. Right. Because of course that's part of the, uh, you know, We've, we've invested resources in the, in the youth and trail project. I would hate for that to build a park there and actually break the, the access to that area on, on foot and, and require it to be a, a almost have to drive through that park uh, sure. because of that, that, that crossing right there, which is already, like I said, already difficult. Agreed. Um. Do you Oh. Go ahead, Mimi, if you want to. I might have another question or two. Um, well, you had mentioned, John, um, that you would want an extended construction timeline and build in phases. Uh, where do you see the park development in uh, that construction timeline? So my thoughts are when we um, build the first warehouse building that we would begin construction on uh, either all or a portion of the park. Uh, would be my thoughts. That would be uh, done as part of our initial improvements there. Get that up and running. Um, and I had another question about, um, uh, you had mentioned that you would work with the EAC as far as helping uh, the township reach our goals, our ready for 100 resolution to reduce our carbon footprint um, by, you know, having at least the warehouses be solar ready, if that works out uh, fiscally, have you, would you work with the EAC and the township administration to do other kinds of um, things that would help reduce the carbon uh, footprint of this project? Sure, I'll be glad when it's uh, electric semi trailers coming in there. You know, Amazon has a big goal of uh, going uh, electric, uh, I think by 2040, so yeah, absolutely. Completely. So, We'd love to so hear like some ideas. there would be infrastructure if if there were if we were to go to electric fleets you could put the charging infrastructure for the Absolutely. trucks in there okay um I, my other concern was noise pollution how how do you plan to address whatever truck noise pollution might so be a until we get to electric semis, uh, yeah, uh, the newer trucks are far less. These aren't the 1970 Max running down the road with the you know smoke pouring out of them. These are you know much more refined vehicles, and they're a lot less noisy. The newer ones compared to the older ones. Um, we are through the land development process. We'll go through that and uh, make sure that the township uh, understands completely what what that looks like and. Uh, and what the impacts are. What I do know is the turnpike is very noisy already. Um, mm -hmm. It's very loud and actually near Route 100 and the turnpike is also another uh, quite noisy area. So 
you know, figuring out how we fit in is an important part of this. Could, could involve some sound walls and uh, some things to help uh, certainly the neighbors to the rear there, on, uh, J.W. Pepper and so on. What would your hours be for the park for public um, use? And I would say to you that really boils down to what we as a group, meaning us, the township, and all the agencies that are involved in that, decide makes the most sense. You know, what are, the, how do we program it? So open space is fine, but really what you need is a program, when you can use it, what you can do, what events you hold there. Uh, I think that's a joint effort. I think we need to come together on that and get some good minds together and balance uh, everybody's uh, desires and needs to, to get the best product when we're done. Thank you. Um, I had a quick question. I know that the, in the previously approved plan, Vanguard had pledged a contribution to emergency services. Um, would you be willing to match that? I'll tell you what I'd like to do with that. I'd like, again, I, I viewed the park as kind of the initial donation. Um, I'm not against a emergency services donation. What I'd like to do is kind of find out what the, what the full gamut of what the township has interest in and then find out where maybe through this development and the next development and so on, what we can do to help meet the goals of the township. So not sidestepping the question, but saying we have more development to do here. Uh, I'd like to focus on the park to start with. And then as I do more, certainly try to um, get our way up to both with it, whether it's a pedestrian bridge donation, emergency services donation, but basically work through um, as these other developments come up, a, a method to get to where you want to get to, which, and I'm familiar with the number two and a million dollars. <laughs> I'm sure Mamie would have reminded you, so. <laughs> Uh, so I, I have a, a question, and, and maybe this is for later, but for lighting on the on the on the uh, on for the parking area and so forth. Um, you know, this is a pretty large area; it's not going to be lit, sure. but not lit before. And you know, there's light pollution that affects both just you know people's ability to see the sky as well as you know nature sure. and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I saw our lighting consultant suggested using three thousand K. You know, do you have any objection to that or, and also the timing, if this is all, is there any way, is, is this going to be all, all night long, it'll be on, or is this going to be timed in any way? Things like that, I would like to, to, to have um, considered that, that we don't have light pollution throughout the night if it's not necessary. Sure. Um, I know there's been significant advancement in lighting technology with LED fixtures, dark sky mm -hmm. fixtures, uh, you know, the length of the poles. I'm not a lighting expert, but okay. I will assure you that we, along with your consultant, will work through the best lighting opportunity there that minimizes exactly what you're talking about, um, the light pollution. And you have what I would call significant uh, ordinance uh, requirements to, to meet as well. So you're ahead of the curve on what, what you like to see there. And, and certainly with these new advancements, I think it gives us an opportunity to get where you want to get. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have questions about the traffic that I'll hold. Okay. So other than that, I'm, I'm done. Okay, for the board. Uh, um, yeah. Ms. Kearney, do you have any redirect? Uh, yes. Um, actually, I think, Don, you did answer that with one question um, in reference to the distance from warehouse A to the edge of the building. So that was my only question. I think you did answer that. 335 to be yeah. exact, Three, 335 feet. Okay, and, and based on that, Mr. Buck, I'm assuming no recross? Correct, thank you. Um, Ms. Carey, do you wanna, how do you wanna do your exhibits? You wanna do them now per witness? Well, actually, can I, can I make one suggestion, please? Um, obviously, from our perspective, the main thing here that concerns people is the access points and the truck traffic and the use of Shree Boulevard and Route 100. Um, we are engaging a traffic consultant to look at this with the idea of if there are other good ideas to make this work better, we'd like to present them to Audubon and to the township to try to make sure that this is done in the most 
uh, beneficial way for everybody. And, and if that's the case, I, I, and given that we're likely not to get through all of Ms. Kearney's, all the applicants' witnesses tonight, might make sense to hold off on the traffic one till next time and maybe go with the other ones tonight. Uh, Ms. Kearney? Oh, you're, you're muted. I'm sorry. Um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, our engineer was going to go next. I thought you may want to hear from our traffic engineer uh, prior, because uh, I'm not sure how late we'll go tonight. But if you, we can certainly do that. We can hold off on Eric Austin Chuck from TP and D if, if you want to wait on that. I just think, yeah, uh, I think that might make sense that so we have a chance to have somebody take a look at the plans and the the McMahon review letter and those things, and then have it all done in one night. Um, just thought, okay. maybe um, do the engineer first. And Bill had wanted to ask, the supervisor Bill wanted to ask some questions to the traffic. How does, I don't know how that plays into this, but I just was curious. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a preference. Um, Okay, and, and I'll guess my press. I'll get my questions answered either yeah. way. <laughs> and truthfully, I think we're probably not going to go past ten thirty tonight anyway. Okay. Um, okay. So I think we're we're um, and and um, so let's do this. Do you want to, Miss Carey? Do you want to do your exhibits now, or do you want to wait till you're done with your whole case, and then we'll just do them all at one time? Let's do them all at one time. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then. We can certainly start the next witness. You know, if it's going to be an expert, we can get through voir dire and do all that. And, and uh, you know, we can start some of the introductory stuff, see how far we get. But I, I think uh, I think it's probably a fair bet we're not getting through all the witnesses tonight. So, um, but then we probably should, um, uh, you, me, and Mr. Buck should probably talk and, and then I can talk to the board and staff about uh, when we should do uh, the next hearing, maybe we should um, potentially talk about a, a separate night uh, from, you know, separate and apart from a regular board meeting to, to move this along. I have, uh, I have a feeling this may take a few nights. Um, so we can uh, work on that. We can work on schedule. Okay. Uh, the next witness I had was the engineer, uh, Kestra Kelly. I, I don't know if I saw her on here. Oh, there she is. Yes. Um, and Kestra CV is listed as a, at exhibit tab 18. I don't know if we could bring that up. And Kestra, can you uh, just spell your first and last name for the court reporter? It is shown on your Zoom picture. Sure. First name is Kestra, K-E-S-T-R-A. Last name is Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y. And uh, hand, we, I'll, let me swear her in. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Kelly, raise your right hand to be, or Miss, Miss Kelly, raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Kestra, uh, by whom are you employed? BL Companies, B as in boy, L as in long. And can you briefly just, can you briefly describe what you do for your employer? I'm a project manager in the site civil group, focusing primarily on land development. And can you uh, give the board a brief description of your educational background and employment history? Sure, I have a BS in civil engineering from Virginia Tech. I'm a registered professional engineer. Um, I've worked in the civil engineering field, mainly on land development for the last 20 years. And um, I think we're looking at, can you just give some representative types of projects that you've worked on in the past few years, focusing on Pennsylvania? Sure, I mean, I've worked on multi-millions of square feet of industrial warehouse distribution developments for national developers within Pennsylvania and also nationwide. Um, I think that uh, the, my resume speaks for itself in terms of my experience. I have experience with land development 
um, for both industrial warehouse developments, multifamily, uh, residential, uh, and commercial. And um, have you previously testified before uh, municipal bodies in Pennsylvania? Yes, I have. And can you just name a few for the board? Um, most recently, the Zoning Hearing Board for Hilltown Township and the Zoning Hearing Board at West Donegal Township. And have you previously been accepted as an expert witness before, the, before boards in Pennsylvania? Yes. And what type of expert witness? In land development. And I'd like to offer um, Esther Kelly as an expert in land development, as an engineer, civil engineer, in it, with a specialty in land development. Uh, okay, Mr. Buck, do you have any uh, questions? No, no, no objection to that. Okay. But does the board have any questions? No, uh, she sounds like an expert. Okay. I, I will accept uh, Ms. Kelly as an expert in civil engineering with a specialty in land development. Thank you. Um, and Kestra, you've been retained by the applicant for the purposes of the development of the um, properties that we were looking at on the conditional use plan? Yes, I have. And there are four properties that make up the um, 169 acres that's the subject of the conditional use application? Correct. And is the intent is for the four properties to be consolidated? Correct. And I actually said the size. What's the size of the four, four it's consolidated? It's 169 acres. And Tara, if you could go back to the conditional use plan, I think as, yes, thank you. And um, can you just generally describe the um, subject properties? Sure, the existing site, approximately a quarter of the site slopes to the north um, and drains to an unnamed tributary of Pickering Creek. Um, the remainder of the site slopes to the south and drains toward Shimona Creek. Um, both of these, drainage um, watersheds have streams and associated wetlands and buffers. There's no FEMA mapped floodplains on the site. The site is primarily agricultural currently with obviously some historical structures and there are some trees. And the zoning, can you describe the zoning classification of the properties? The site is currently zoned PIC, Planned Industrial Commercial. And can you briefly describe, as Mr. Nielsen has, uh, has already um, described, the surrounding uses and properties? Sure, I would agree with Mr. Nielsen's testimony. Um, the site is surrounded by um, zones that are all commercial industrial in nature, PCID, PIC, PC, PC2, PI. It's, the site is not adjacent to any residential zoning districts. And in our conditional use letter that we filed with the uh, township, we had indicated, as you can see on the plan, the distribution warehouse A, B, e, and C, and the sizes are noted on the plan as well as the parking, correct? Correct. And um, initially, we had indicated that um, warehouse A would likely be 50 feet, warehouse B, 50 feet, and warehouse C, 40 feet, correct? Correct. That is our, um, that's what we put on the plan, and my understanding is that is subject to change between the 35 feet and the 65 feet. And the distribution warehouse is a use permitted by right in the PIC district. Correct. And also the offices when the, within the distribution warehouses are used permitted by right? Correct. And we meet the zoning requirements such as for lot area and um, setbacks. We're not asking for any relief in relation to that. Correct. If we had uh, provided the township with a plan that um, shows we had provided the township with a sketch plan that shows compliance with the requirements of section 601.3 
as to the erection of more than one principal structure on a lot. And you have to meet the lot area, yard, and other requirements of the ordinance as though these were each distribution warehouse was on an individual lot. And we have provided that plan, correct? We have provided that plan and that plan shows that we meet all those requirements. And did you review the PIC um, ordinance and is the proposed use in compliance with the purpose for large site industrial development to meet the current and future township, regional and community needs? Yes, I believe so in my professional opinion. Um, again, warehousing and distribution are approved uses within the zone. Uh, this site is optimally loca located since there are no residential zones adjacent to it. Uh, the site has significant access to major highways, again pointing to one of the reasons why it was zoned PIC. Um, I think that this proposed development serves the public need to support the increased demand in commercial and industrial warehousing which has grown exponentially and it's, it's expected to continue to grow. Um, I think that we've worked with the applicant to develop a plan that honors the existing environmental features on site and truly limits any impacts to the maximum extent feasible. The applicants agreed to work with and maintain the historical structures on the site um, and the applicant, as discussed, is willing to work with the township to, to provide a public park. Um, I've worked with many, many developers over my years, and this applicant really is, um, stands out as being open to wanting to work with the township, being good neighbors. Um, I think everything that you've heard today proves that. Um, you know, one of the things that had already been incorporated in the plan was locating the buildings where we did, which was not right up against the setbacks. It gave additional space to providing buffering and screening and softening of the development. And as indicated at the beginning of the hearing, we're asking for conditional use approval uh, for structures over two and a half stories or 35 feet in height up to 65 feet in height and for the non-residential structures that contain more than 40,000 or, or have a total combined parking space count of over 200. Those are, those are the two that we're focusing on with your testimony, correct? Correct. And there's no specific end user identified for these three uh, warehouse distribution facilities as Mr. Nielsen had indicated. So the heights could change. Right, and you know, my experience that's typical with a project at this stage is to not have an end user. And due to the, uh, as part of the zoning ordinance, it indicates that if you have a certain height, um, the impervious and building coverage have to be adjusted as you go higher. Can you explain to the board how the applicant would be able to meet that? Sure. Um, we fully intend to comply with the code. We have provided to the township an exhibit to show how the current concept sketch plan meets that. We um, took a similar approach as Vanguard did. And we basically did a weighted average in terms of the building height. Um, so we went around the perimeter, figured out percentage-wise how much of each building is a certain height. Um, and then based on that, we were able to get a weighted average building height for all three buildings combined. Um, any, there is a penalty in terms of percentages of impervious cover. You get over 35 feet. So we've applied that formula to the current concept plan and we have adjusted the impervious cover and the current plan is underneath, is below that coverage. So that would be the same approach that we would use if something had to be adjusted in terms of building heights. Um, this is a large site and it does give us flexibility um, to a degree, keeping in mind all the site constraints, but we do have the ability to reduce impervious if we needed to go higher, we have their, that flexibility. And um, 
as Mr. Nielsen indicated, the buildings are required and will all be sprinklered according to the to the provisions of the Euclid Township Code, fire code? Correct. The buildings are going to meet all of the International Building Code standards, including Euclid Township standards. And the fire marshal had sent a review letter that indicated certain items had to be done, such as properly identifying the building, installing knock boxes, providing water main layouts and fire hydrant layouts. And that would, would the applicant comply with those and when would that be done? Yes, the applicant would comply with those and that would be done through the land development process. And all of those are typical requirements for a facility such as this. And the landscaping and screening will be designed as part of land development also? That's correct. And, um, and again, as the fire marshal indicated, it will not be designed so as to impede fire department access. Correct. And any fenced in and truck or trailer parking areas will be designed to have fire department access also? That is correct. And is there sufficient land area available to be able to effectively screen the proposed development from adjoining the adjoining uses from adverse impacts, if any? Yes, as I mentioned previously, you know, not only do we have the setbacks that are required by the code, but we go above and beyond that to provide additional area to give us flexibility during land development to implement various different measures such as berming, landscaping, fences, walls, to screen and soften the viewscapes. And uh, the lighting plan was submitted as part of our conditional use application and it's exhibit tab eight um, to the exhibit booklet. Uh, and we've received a review letter on that, correct? That is correct. And will the applicant work with the township recommendations for lighting as part of the land development process? Yes. And in your opinion, will the lighting have an adverse impact on the neighboring properties? No. That's based on, you know, the, the lighting plan we submitted during for this conditional use is obviously, again, preliminary in nature as we're still refining the site as you would expect prior to going through land development. Uh, but even at that point, you know, all the lighting levels at the property line were zero to 0 0.1 foot candles, which is in conformance with the township code. And um, the property will be served by public water and public sewer? Yes, I agree with Mr. Nielsen's testimony um, and the, the fact that the, we've got aqua will serve letter and sufficient sewer capacity. And the aqua will serve as exhibit tab five and the sewer capacity is exhibit tab six. Um, and uh, the solid waste disposal, how will that be handled? That will all be designed and planned for during land development um, in terms of where dumpster locations will be, how access will be obtained, as well as how screening will occur. And do you see any issues with being able to uh, effectively do that as part of the land development? I don't anticipate any issues with that. Again, these are very um, standard buildings for this type of development. And uh, so the, we, we know how to design for these items. And in your professional opinion, is the size, scope, extent, and character of the conditional uses for height and the 40,000 plus and more than 200 parking spaces consistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the PIC ordinance? It is. Again, you know, warehousing and distribution are both approved uses with this in the zone. And, you know, this plan is consistent with, again, warehouse distribution developments. It has the scale, size, and scope to respond to de the demands of the market's needs. And in your professional opinion, will the proposed conditional uses for height and the over 40,000 square feet and more than 200 parking spaces cause negative impacts of a type or degree not usually associated with a distribution warehouse? No, it will not. 
and in your professional opinion, will the proposed development constitute an appropriate use in the area and not injure or detract from the use of surrounding properties or from the character of the neighborhood? Correct. And um, as Mr. Nielsen had indicated, the applicant was um, willing to work with the neighbors, uh, specifically the pepper and the daycare in reference to providing landscaping? Correct. I think that's all the questions I had for Kestra. Okay. Um, Mr. Buck, about how much do you believe you have? Uh, we have no questions for Ms. Kelly, but we're fine. Okay. How about the board? Does the board have any questions? I don't, I don't have any questions. I did. Um, Kim here. I think I, I need some clarification on some numbers. So if there are six, 1,640 workers, did, was the question referring to 200 parking spaces or 200 plus parking spaces? Because I'm thinking even if you had two workers per car, you would need, um, and then you had two shifts, you would need 400 spaces. I believe you need conditional use um, because we have more than 200 parking spaces. Uh, yes, the way the ordinance reads, if you have a non-residential uh, non building 40,000 square feet or you have more than 200 parking spaces, you have to ask for conditional use. Do you have the a specific number plan, of parking spaces planned? The current plan has 1,144 car parking spaces. Thank you. Um, I had another question, and I don't know who can answer this. Given that there are lots of trucks coming and going, and given that the average tow truck cannot tow a big, a big Mack truck, whatever they're called, the big 18 wheelers, do you know where the closest towing company that is capable of towing a big truck, should it break down? Where the closest tow truck company sits? <laughs> Uh, we have that. I, I know we could we could find that out and get back to you. Thank you. Is that is that all, Ms. Dunn? Okay. Yes, that's it. Thank you. A any any other supervisor questions? I don't have any questions. All right, um, Ms. Carney, based on that, any redirect? No. Okay. All right, then, uh, uh, Ms. Kelly, thank you. Um, and I think we'll probably end here for tonight. And Ms. Kearney, Mr. Buck, maybe we can talk this week um, and try and figure out um, the plan forward, what what works for everybody as far as uh, proceeding with uh, some more days. Maybe we can get a, a few dates and I can circle back also with the board and staff about dates that they may be available. Yes. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right. Well, thank everybody. Um, I know it's, it's late. I know, you know, we didn't make it a marathon, so I guess that's a good thing, but so uh, we uh, we will reconvene. Um, we'll, I'm sure once we have dates, it'll be posted up on the uh, on the township website. Thank you very much for this opportunity. We look forward to working with you and working with the neighbors uh, as we work our way through this process. Good night, Thanks. everyone. Thank, Thank you. Good night. I have a question. Thanks. Bye. This is Lorraine, the court reporter. I just wanted to ask Ms. Kearney, who who are you with? Did you say it was Hamburg? Ruben, Ruben Mullen, okay, in um, Lansdale? Yes. All right, and Mr. Buck? 
I'm with Stevens and Lee. In Reading? Correct. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you. Bye.